outset of the meeting, we respectfully ask everyone in the audience and at the dais as well, please silence your phone, your laptop, your <coughs> tablet, or anything else you have, because all of the presenters before the board have but a limited time to speak. We don't want any interruptions that would compromise their limited time. Thanks in advance for your cooperation on that matter. In each of today's public hearings, the board will have reviewed the correspondence that's been submitted, whether in support of or opposition to each of these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies, and in some cases, elected officials, with regard uh, to the cases and in their preparation for the hearings. In today's hearing, staff will make a presentation of the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the formal case record. At the conclusion of the staff's presentation, the appellant will have the opportunity to present his or her case before the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear from those who wish to speak in support of the appeal. With contested cases, opponents will have the opportunity to present after those speaking in support. And finally, after opposition presentation, an appellant would have an opportunity to come forward and give limited rebuttal proof to the board as well. Under the Board of Zoning uh, BZA's rules of procedure, the appellant has five minutes for a presentation if there is no opposition present. In contested cases, each side has 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Again, that's 10 minutes per side. That's not 10 minutes per person. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, that time would come out of the originally allocated 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each of these hearings, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case before them. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, namely section 17.40.180. Each of the sections to which we refer today in these hearings will come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the metropolitan government. The zoning code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January the 1st of 1998. I'll introduce the entire zoning code and make it part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are uh, recorded for the Metro Nashville network and later uploaded to YouTube as well, it is imperative that anyone wishing to address the board come forward, sit at the front table, speak into the microphone after introducing yourself by name and address. Only those comments will be considered by the board. Only those comments will be part of the case record. Any comments from the gallery will not only be not part of the record, but also be potentially grounds by which we politely ask you to leave the building, lest you interfere with or otherwise interrupt our proceedings. Again, speakers should identify themselves by name and address before making any desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four of our board members out of the seven board members in order to establish quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present and an appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, then the case at hand will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within that 30-day window shall be deemed denied by operation of law. In the event that the board loses its quorum, meaning fewer than four members are still present, the meeting ends immediately because we will not have legal authority to continue and take action on those cases. In that unlikely event, all cases that have not been heard will be rolled to our next docket, which is set for December the 20th, 2018. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to the Chancery Court via writ of certiorari within 60 days of the original hearing date. Additionally, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing within 60 days of the original hearing date pursuant to the terms of the BZA rules of procedure. After that 60-day window of time elapses, no further action can be taken and the board's decision becomes final. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you are in fact required to obtain the permit for which you have applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for a board, a board approval to remain valid. It should be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order. All appellants have been notified by certified mail and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled for these cases today. We have a number of cases, Mr. Chairman, that have been either withdrawn or deferred to a later date, some of which have only been deferred in the last few minutes. I'd like to read those into the record here at the outset, if we may. Okay. First, case 2018-522, involving the property at 1704 Carvel, deferred one meeting to our December the 20th docket. Next, case 2018-560, involving the property at 3134 Dickerson Pike. That case has been withdrawn. Okay. 
Case 2018-644, involving the property at 1044 2nd Avenue South. That case has been deferred one meeting to December the 20th, 2018. Case 2018-664, that case has been withdrawn. That's the case involving the property at 2705 12th Avenue South. Case 2018-668, involving the property at 409 Gallatin Pike, withdrawn. And then from the second half of our docket, Mr. Chairman, a number of withdrawals, or rather uh, deferrals as well. First case 2018-627, involving the property at 1822A, 9th Avenue North. That case has been withdrawn. Next case 2018-636, involving the property at 1009 Battlefield Drive, deferred one meeting. Pardon me? Three meetings to the second meeting in January. Next case, 2018-662, involving the property at 1014B West Grove Avenue, deferred. Next case, 2018-666, which staff will note is a short-term rental case, deferred to a later date. I believe that completes the list of the withdrawn and deferred cases, Mr. Chairman, from today's original docket. Okay, very good. Be before we get started, I want to welcome our newest member of the BZA, Ross Pepper, over here. Thank you for serving uh, your city uh, this way, and thank you, Mayor Briley, for appointing Ross. Ross is a uh, longtime Nashvilleian and a real estate lawyer and has been very involved in the community and we are welcoming him to the BZA. He's taking this spot that Dick King was in for many, many years, who he lost earlier this year. And uh, just like I said, welcome aboard. Thank you for being here. And um, while we're mentioning mayors, I would like to mention one of our great mayors of the last 50 years, and we've had many great mayors in the last 50 years here in Nashville. Richard Fulton recently passed away, who this complex is named after. And when I joined the BZA, we were in another room over here. And in the back of the room, John Michael will probably remember, we had pictures of former mayors of Nashville, including Richard Fulton's big picture was in the back. And Richard Fulton was a congressman, he was a mayor, and really was famous for voting for the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964 only one of three Southern congressmen to do it um, in his first term in office. He was elected in 1962. And when he became mayor of Nashville, he served three terms as mayor. He uh, revitalized downtown, built the convention center, Riverfront Park. That was the kind of the, the skid of Nashville declining downtown was stopped during his administration and he laid some of the groundworks that we enjoy today of this its city. So. Um, we um, send our condolences to the Fulton family and all of his friends and family and colleagues that worked with him. Um, and it's an honor to be in this complex that is named in his honor, which was during his lifetime. And um, with our new um, uh, lawyer here, Ross is a lawyer here, we now have a count of four lawyers on the BZA. We still have our three Davids. We have two architects. I guess the partridge in a pear tree, too, right? So, John Michael, take us, take us away. Mr. Chairman, one other preliminary announcement that I failed to make on the original list, that's involving case 2018-566, involving the property at 1506 Church Street. That case will have to be deferred one more meeting to the December 20th docket. Again, that's 566, involving the property at 1506, deferred one meeting to the December the 20th docket. Oh. Sure. May, may I ask the chairman something sure. and the rest of the board? Of course. Um, at the last meeting, um, we ended suddenly because of the emergency alarm. Some of you were here for that. And I wanted to see if those cases that were not heard um, because of the emergency alarm could be moved to the top of the dock. Okay. Um, there has been a request, John Michael, to move the, yes, one case that we had. Five, six, I think. It was the sidewalk oh, the case, and there were one, two, three, four, five short-term rentals. So 
Um, the sidewalk. That's not a list of cases we have in front of us at this point. We do have the one that we can correctly identify as the one that was midstream when we departed. Uh, staff would have no problem queuing up that case first. As to the others, yeah. because of the mixed docket from last to this, we just don't have a clean list of those. I'm sorry for that. I, I made a list, but I guess I'm not Metro, so. Okay. But I think my we, list doesn't we can take the sidewalk case okay. if you I'm want trying. to. Okay. okay. Sean Michael? Um, presumably the board members can consider whether or not to take action with regard to the rearrangement of the docket. In the meanwhile, I'll present the board's consent agenda oh, here at the yes, outset of the okay. meeting, of course. Very good. Uh, for the members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meeting. In that scenario, one board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action from the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that uh, testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in the audience in opposition to one of the cases identified for consent agenda, just raise your hand, make sure that I see you, and we'll remove the case from consent agenda and then have it heard in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, these are the cases that have been recommended for consent agenda. First, case 2018-632, that involves a property at 1315 Greenwood Avenue involving a variance from fence height for a front yard 39 inch fence. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 632? Seeing none, the next case on proposed consent agenda is 635, that's 2018-635, involving the property at 927 Woodland Street. Board members may recall that this property came before you somewhat recently with regard to a parking variance involving a limited number of spaces at the front of the property. This is a request for a sidewalk variance which will help preserve those parking spaces that you carved out with the prior variants. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 635? Yes. That case will be heard in its regular order. The next case on the proposed consent agenda is 2018-638, involving the property at 1281 Third Avenue South, a sidewalk variance request. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 638? Seeing none, the next case on the consent agenda is, nine, is case 2018-645, involving the property at 935 East Trinity Lane, a sidewalk variance request. As with case 638 before it, case 645 also agrees to meet planning's recommendations for the case. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 645? Seeing none, the next case on the proposed consent agenda is case 2018-649, involving the property at 1209 Nickel Lane, involving a reduction in side setback and a variance thereto. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 649? Seeing none, the next case on the proposed consent agenda is 2018-654, involving the property at 1954 Union Hill Road, a variance request for a reduction in side setback. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 654? Seeing none, the next case on the proposed consent agenda is 2018-656, involving the property at 3509B Renwood Drive, a request for a variance from side setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 656? And that's on the six inch variance? Very well. Case 656 will be heard in its regular order. The next case on the proposed consent agenda is 2018-678, involving the property at 520 Weekly Avenue, a variance request from front setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 678? Seeing none, the next case on the proposed consent agenda is 2018-680, involving the unnumbered property on Sharp Avenue in East Nashville, involving a variance request for front setback. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 680? That case will be heard in its regular order. And finally, the last item on the proposed consent agenda is 2018-687, involving the property at 619 Rosebank Avenue, a sidewalk variance request. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 687? Seeing none, the remnants of the consent agenda are as follows, Mr. Chairman. Case 632, case 638, case 645, case 649, case 654, Case 678, 
and case 687. Staff would respectfully solicit a motion from the board at this time. Okay, those cases have been properly moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? No second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion about the consent agenda? I just agenda? have a note that many of those sidewalk cases um, were on consent because they agreed to planning, the planning department's recommendations. That's exactly right, and each of the approvals are conditioned upon meeting the planning department's <coughs> recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Okay, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael. Members of the public, if your case was just approved on the consent agenda, you're done here today. Give our staff until Monday in order to process all the documentation associated with your appeal. Then come in and begin the process of pursuing the permit for which you have originally applied. Although you're welcome to stay, you are also welcome to go. We will present all of the other cases in just a few moments. However, here at the outset of the meeting, we'd like to use this opportunity to recognize elected officials who are in attendance with us. I know uh, Council Member Kathleen Murphy from District 24 is present. I don't think I saw any other council members uh, today. Council Member Murphy, did you wish to address the board at this point? Welcome to the BZA, Council Lady Murphy. Thank you for being here. You didn't bring us any of your colleagues today for some reason. Oh, I guess Where's I am the only Councilman one. Councilman Withers, Councilman Davis. Well, they, they probably heard you had a really long docket, <laughs> so um, I drew the short straw to represent us all. I'll go through the entire docket now with y'all and give you my opinion, so I'm kidding. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few cases because I'm not able to stay. Um, so I kind of lost track of where we are, but it, it's case 2018. 590. This is one that I think a number of my constituents have. So the address is 4404A West Lawn. Mm -hmm. This is um, this came before y'all before, I believe, and a number of, of constituents have written in. They are kind of torn over the fact that um, first there was some issue about the duplex part. I think that got worked out, but there there's some concern over how big is this additional build is going to is going to be. I haven't seen the site plan. Um, evidently there is a water pipe or a sewer pipe um, and some easement, easement um, things which is creating a hardship and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to remind you that I've got some constituents who they were against this and now they're a little bit torn over like what's going to be better, like let them build something or where where they, with the variance or let them build something totally new. So I just wanted to make sure that y'all reviewed the correspondence from my do you, constituents. Do you have an opinion on this case? Um, I'm a little torn because I haven't seen the, the site plan with the water pipe, and so I don't know if that water pipe runs through multiple properties or whether it's this just this one. I think it may be just this one, therefore it does create a variance hardship, but if it runs through the other properties, then that's one that y'all need to be determining. Yeah, and I think that at the last hearing we had, uh, had talked about the lack of hardship for any type of side setback, but we really kind of left it as... There, there was an adequate building envelope even outside of the pipe uh, to build what they had said they were going to build last time, and it was what kind of rear setback, which they seemed to have a hardship because of the pipe, and then right. that was a negotiation with the neighbors. Is it 10 feet? Is it 5 feet? Is it 15 feet? Uh, if it was going to be less than the 20 feet uh, required by code, but uh, that, that's just kind of what I think where we left it was uh, the open question was negotiating that uh, potential rear setback. Okay. And from correspondence that I've had with the neighbors as of today and texting with them just yesterday, I'm not sure if that was communicated prop to them. I don't think they knew that they could say one way or, or you know, kind of had that negotiation. Oh, no, so. they, I mean, they, yeah. Okay. So well, they, they can certainly stay here. I mean, and if some of I them I know that the neighbors are not here today. No. So. None of them are? I, I don't, I mean, we can oh, ask for a raise of hands, but who I was bad. talking with yesterday, they had said that they, they, they okay. weren't coming today. So okay. um, then I also wanted to touch on case 2018-616, which is 221 38th Avenue North. While I am always going to be advocating for sidewalks, this is one where they this property is on a dead-end street. Um, the likelihood of Metro getting to sidewalks on a dead-end street is going to be multiple generations from now, if even then. Um, and there's a historic wall here. And so I am leaning that I am I'm totally Totally okay with them not having to tear down a historic wall to build a sidewalk that this one is most likely going to be a sidewalk to nowhere for any time soon. So, so I'm okay with y'all granting that variance. What about the fund? 
that's something that I just can't advocate on, um, and I haven't watched and paid attention enough to how y'all have done that. Well, um, but I think this is one that would be costly for them to build or not build, and so. So you're saying they shouldn't have to pay into the fund, or you're not having an opinion on that? It is very hard for me not to advocate that anybody not pay into okay. the fund when they're not building. Because but I will remind you and other council members of the Ewing Doctrine. <laughs> the council person comes down here and personally says someone shouldn't have to build a sidewalk or pay into the fund. That means a lot for me. Right. And Some I'm, council people use that more than others. But, yes. But I'm but definitely I, saying they don't. They shouldn't have to, to build, build this it, one. But the fund you still. Is, okay. I just don't think I should say anything on that okay. part of it. Very and good. Leave you all the the um, okay. the heavy weight of figuring that out. And then I sure. think I have one or two more in my district. I'm sorry. Um, I think it's into your short-term rental um, portion of your evening. Uh, the Titans will probably be playing by then. Yes, hopefully there's a Titan that lives in this area that I'm going to be discussing. Okay, so it is case number, I think it's on my last page of your docket, case number 2018-673. Um, so short, so this area of my district, um, 37, 36th Avenue, it's, um, it is an area that is overrun with short-term rentals, and we've taken many to environmental court. There have been stop order, stop work orders on many of them in this area that have continued to rent. It seems to be just like an attraction for bad short-term rental owners um, to come into. And so, just in discussion with neighbors in general, if there's a short-term violation, a short-term rental violation, I just don't think that any exceptions should be given. Um, I haven't heard a, a, a reason from um, one that they should, and this is just an area that has been overrun and taken advantage of, and so I ask that you do not grant any exceptions on that. And I, that does remind me, I did miss one that got bumped from consent in my district. 656. 656. I can't find it on here. It's one where a garage was built without a permit. Um, I'll remind you that I've come before y'all before and kind of given a little bit of a lecture about how you're not the board of forgiveness. Um, you have very strict guidelines from the state um, and from Metro, I think, that kind of tell you when you can grant variances and not grant variances. And especially when somebody has built something without a permit, um, that is a red flag and concerning, and then to come and ask for forgiveness. And I appreciate that there are neighbors here today who have it very well documented what their concerns are with this, and so they'll be presenting um, when the case is before you, but I wanted to lend my support to them and encourage you to, to deny the variances because, again, you're not, it's, it's a variance, it's not forgiveness, and when you don't pull a permit, there, there are consequences for that. Okay. So, did we get that right case number? 656. Six. Okay. okay. Great. Renwood, okay. yes. Any questions for Council A. Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And you do have a colleague that showed up. Oh, Councilman yeah. Davis is As noted by back. Mr. Chairman, that's right. It's Councilman Scott Davis from District 5 is present. Councilman Davis, do you wish to address the board? Very well. He'll wait till the cases are called. Uh, with that, absent any other announcements, Mr. Chairman, okay. we'll proceed with the uh, first so, numbered case, or we'll let the board decide if they want to take any different so cases out of order. We would like to take case 629 out of order, which was the case that was we were hearing during the fire drill. So if that individual is here in case 6. 29, please come forward and we will finish this up. Uh, that's so, John Michael, there's a question. Um, Cindy wasn't here for the case, so can she participate? If the board wishes to rehear the case from scratch, yes. Yeah, let's hear Otherwise, from scratch, no. We were. So let's start from This the is top. just for the benefit of our record. Let me note that this was, of course, the case that ended midstream, ended before it ended, as we had a literal fire alarm that caused an evacuation of the building uh, well into the evening at our last uh, BZA meeting. As a result, this case not only was not voted on, but the case was not heard in its entirety. It does seem prudent for the board to hear it from scratch, allow the appellant to present every document, every argument, and any other comments that he might wish in support for his appeal request. You have uh, correspondence from the district council member, Brett Withers, from District 6, in your uh, file already. We'll go through a simple staff presentation of the maps, site plans, etc. cetera, uh, give you a chance to then hear the case. Here's the overview of case 29-629. The zoning map demonstrates, of course, this R6 zoned property on the stretch of 10th before it gets all the way up to Fatherland. The aerial photograph gives you a sense of the houses along that stretch of 10th Street before you get into a little bit more of a commercial area. 
The site plan submitted shows a proposed layout for the construction that's intended at this location. And of course, the request before you is a request for a variance from sidewalk requirements in this R6 zoning district. The view up and down the street in its current condition with the existing sidewalk shown here. Again, you have the written recommendation from the planning department with regard to this project. You have the councilman's input. Uh, the appellant will have the opportunity to make his desired presentation. Sir, if you'll just introduce yourself once again by name and address and then take it up with the board. Hi, my name is Chris Wright, 2204 Eastland Avenue, uh, 37206. Um, so I, I'm just asking uh, just with the sidewalk, uh, because there's currently a sidewalk there and a grass buffer, um, just, just asking if we could keep the sidewalk without having to pay the Enlua fee, if those are the only two options that we have, uh, building the sidewalk is gonna be less than half the cost of the Enlua fee, so we would we would go ahead and put the sidewalk in, but a sidewalk there will be misaligned, and that's, that's the image that I presented to the board. So if those were the only two options, okay. we, would, we would be building the sidewalk, a misaligned sidewalk. I'd like to present a third option. There was a case that was heard before mine last month, case 2018-625, and in that case, there was an existing sidewalk and the, uh, the appellant offered to maintain and repair the sidewalk in front of, in front of that structure, and uh, the board approved that and uh, with no in lieu of fee. I believe so, that was at the recommendation of planning and that was probably a newer sidewalk than this one right here. Well, I mean, it, what, what, would, what would maintaining this one involve? I mean, is it in disrepair or is it, and it looks like I, it's in great shape. I mean, yeah. th this seems to be the kind of example that we're struggling with all along is that you've got a, 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 a nice sidewalk that goes for many, many blocks and, mm -hmm yet the code has changed and, and you're required to do something different and it's cheaper for you to do something different that screws up the, the flow of the sidewalk than it is to, to pay the fine. So, yes, sir. Uh, I mean, it kind of puts us in a bind, but um, I think, and I, I do remember in some of those cases though, the, that when they recommend maintain the existing sidewalk, there is an ADA uh, uh, adaptability, you, you know, that they ask that, you know, that sometimes it's a corner lot and they say, well, bring it up to ADA standards and. So there's an expense on some of those sidewalks that where the planning department says you don't have to pay that uh, by maintaining it and fixing it up, you know, the applicant, you know, uh, accepts. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not usually a totally kind of free ride, so to speak, from the planning department, but. So in this case, it's also a little different. Your council person is against it. So as I mentioned to the last council person was up, up in front of this, that carries a lot of weight with me. And yes, sir. Council person basically says you should either pay into the fund or build a new sidewalk. Yes, sir. Can uh, last time I also present the option of um, if we could keep the sidewalk as it is. Is there is there an, an option to pay into the Enlua fee the amount that it would cost us to build the sidewalk? Nope. The John Michael, the is he not here? But the Enlu fee is set by the Metro Council. We didn't. I believe it's set by Public Works and it's evaluated annually. Yeah, and so we don't have any control over the amount of the in lieu fee. We hear from developers all the time that they say it's cheaper sometimes to build a sidewalk and then pay in the in lieu fee, but you know, that's kind of where we are. Any questions for the applicant? Well, the councilman wrote quite a, a lot. I don't know if you read it. It was I haven't added, seen it. Um, November 30th, so it was after the last hearing and he mentioned he would accept as a compromise, dedicating right of way, construct sidewalks with alternative design where the existing two foot planner strip would remain in place. The applicant would construct new eight foot sidewalks across the property frontage. Does that sound like a, a viable option to you? Uh, g giving right of way, that, that that's something that we would agree to for sure. But the other piece of that, can you can so you define that? So what he's saying that? is, you say you want to keep the existing sidewalk. He's saying keep the two foot strip, strip and then if you're going to build a new sidewalk, make it eight feet wide. Or just extend the, the current one eight feet? Make well, I think you need to, I don't think you could extend. I think you have to tear it up and it's build a, a new one. Yeah, new, I think you're yeah. right, new. Okay, so it's keeping the existing sidewalk and just adding another. No, not no. keeping the existing, keeping okay. the two foot grass strip and then building an eight foot sidewalk. 
So you don't get the zigzag of what you were talking about. I see. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's something that we're open to. Okay. Um, very good. Well, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? Okay. Um, I will move that the um, applicant build the alternative sidewalk, which is keeping the existing two-foot planning strip, building the new eight foot wide sidewalk and dedicating the right away. Okay, motion's been made, is there a second? second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, motion signify by saying aye. Aye, aye. opposed, passes. John Michael, next case. Oh, regular, okay. Top of the agenda. Okay, Mr. Chairman, that'll bring us back to the top of the order, 2018-590. This, as you will recall very thoroughly, involves a property at 4404A as in Adam West Lawn Drive, a council district number 24. You just heard from council member Murphy on this case. Mr. Chairman, I need to stop. We were just joined a few moments ago by council member Devette Blaylock from district number 27, extending the same courtesy that we have to others. We'd like to invite her forward to address the board before we take this next case, if she would like to do so. Council member Blaylock. Councilor Blaylock, welcome to the BZA. Please tell us which case you're here for. And so, actually, yeah, we oh, press. The agenda, Mr. Chairman, that's 2018-639, involving the property at 476 McMurray Drive. Thank you very much. So, this particular church um, um, has had a lot of uh, things before you, and we have had several meetings in the neighborhood. We just had a meeting the other day had a pretty good attendance. There was a few issues that the neighbors had and we addressed all of those. One was the parking. Um, they have a lot of they have a lot of members, which is wonderful. Everybody is in agreement with that. But the parking on the street on both sides was an issue for the neighborhood. So they just didn't want any expansion um, given the future of potentially more parking. So everybody, including the church, agreed that just no parking on the street would satisfy that. So I um, wanted to make sure that that uh, gets in there. He has, um, the church has gone ahead and hired a, um, like a security guard to address the um, traffic flow in mm -hmm. at the beginning and the end of services. And also they have put signs out on the street on their own saying no parking on this side. Um, I've got traffic. Um, They've already ordered, then I've already ordered the no parking signs to be put up. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't been done as of yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so, is that McMurray Street, McMurray it, Drive? That, that it's like? actually Cherrywood. Cherrywood. Yes. So if, if we were to put a condition, it would be that the, the special exception is approved by, as, as long as the applicant agrees to enforce no parking on Cherry Street. Cherrywood. That, that Cherry would be Wood wonderful. Park. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, another issue was they've got a lot of properties around there that they, they ran out or lease out or, you know, whatnot. And there was, there was brush, um, you know, um, some other issues just around maintenance of the property. And they have brought that up to par. I, they've sent me pictures showing that as well, cleaned it up. And um, so I are think- Are those codes that, violations that you're saying? They were- um, uh, Probably not really full code violations, just a little bit of trash and, okay. you know, a little brush, you know, probably nothing that they would have gotten a code violation for, but nevertheless, it was the leaning towards that. Sure. So they have, they have understood that now that it's been brought to their attention several times this past meeting. There was a member of their board there, so I think um, that was a really good addition to their, their meeting. Um, so if we... If we have those conditions, are you in favor of this then? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any questions for Council Lady Blaylock? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see y'all. Mr. Chairman, with that, we'll pick up at 2018-590, as shown here on the zoning map. This involves a property at 4404 West Lawn Drive. Although we said it last time, we'll say it again. The originally filed item A case involving the question of legally nonconforming use, having two residential units on the same property, has been resolved administratively based upon review of more recently submitted documents demonstrating such legally nonconforming use. As a result, the case before you today for the property shown here on the aerial map involves two variance requests. First, the side setback variance from a required five down to three, 
and then a rear setback variance from the required 20, also down to three, in conjunction with the intention to construct the second residential unit there in the ex to the uh, rear of the property. Site plan submitted, at least most recently submitted to my office, demonstrates a proposed layout for this project. The site visit from staff a few weeks back shows the face of the property in its current condition. View up and down the street. The appellants are present. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bars, please come forward, introduce yourself one more time. Mr. Chairman, although you have heard this case already, I know there was some interest in having them have an opportunity to talk with neighbors more, the council member, so we'll leave it to the board to determine to what extent you wish to reopen public hearing, take any different testimony, or merely follow up on your prior questions. Please identify yourself for the record and address and why you're here. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Brad Bars, uh, property owner at 4404 West Lawn Drive. And I'm Alex Bars, also live at 4404 West Lawn. Okay. Um, all we're requesting now is just the rear five foot setback. We're no longer requesting the side or three feet off the back. We're just requesting five feet. Um, as you previously request, requested, we submitted site plans, um, which you should have in front of you, um, that we've gotten drawn up by our architect, David um, Mark Lynn. And um, as previously discussed, what we've tried to do is work those plans that are um, taken into consideration what the neighbor's suggestions are and work within the parameters of our backyard considering the sewer line that goes through the um, middle of that. And, um, and so, uh, but now I think last time you'd said that you were thinking about just doing a garage with an apartment over it. Now you've got a one car garage little house. Yes, sir. But you, leave, but you have plans and elevations, which is more than you have. I mean, you, you've developed the, the program a lot more than you had when we first heard from you. Yes, sir. We met with Mark Lynn, and he's designed a lot of stuff in Sylvan Park, and he laid out a few options, and this is what he recommended that would keep the, you know, integrity of the neighborhood and, and look nice as well. Um, so... One of the, another thing that was really important was to meet with our neighbors. And so what we've done is that um, we've met with our neighbors on multiple occasions since the last meeting, getting their input, suggestions, and concerns. And that's a lot how we've come up with these plans. Um, one of the biggest concerns of the neighbors was the height um, of the structure. So what we've done is we've tried to limit the height, um, uh, which you can see in the drawings as well with the floors. Um, other suggestions that we took into consideration was the neighbor on the right was concerned about parking. So we've, um, you know, put it on record that we want to, she wants us to provide two parking paths. So how'd you come up with five feet? Um, we came up with five feet because um, we thought it was far enough away from the neighbor's side and also uh, kept the footprint what the neighbor suggested. Um, and we were also, you know, the from the talking to our neighbors, they wanted something that, you know, reasonably in height, um, so, so. Okay, I get that. Five feet still close, so, or is everyone happy with five feet, or is there still one or two people not happy? All but our rear neighbor in the very back. We've, you know, we've, all of the um, neighbors that are touching our property, mm -hmm. we've met with them, okay. shown them the plans. So the rear neighbor still opposes with the five now, feet. <laughs> let me ask you on the, the, the rear setback, you, on your building, I'm sorry, David, I don't know, but you have, uh, it looks like on the, the plans that you submitted um, that you've got 32 feet of depth to the house that you plan to build, but the, the building envelope site plan that you gave us has, um, it looks like you got a possible two more feet. What is, what is the maximum uh, if your if your rear neighbor is opposed and and we're sympathetic to, to that opposition, what is the maximum rear setback you can have with the buildable envelope that you have given with the pipe situation? Um, the the maximum is uh, 32 feet and 32.47, um, and I think it was 34.47, but that was with the three foot. So with the two feet, it's a... Uh, well, I, I have 36.55 is the building envelope width. That's what the... And then there, that includes a three-foot setback. That's on this that you all submitted the, the first time. Um, you know, where the garage is there and you have the side setbacks and you have a 41.2-foot wide building envelope and a 36.55 deep. And to me, if you, you know, if you... If you Add that 36 to in the three foot setback. That's a 
39 and a half foot from the property line and your your building is 32 so it seems like you got maybe seven feet to play with okay. on the back is that right or do you have more um, no I think that's correct so so seven so so seven would be the the uh, if you were going to build a 32 foot deep house or carriage house then seven would be the the uh, would be pushing it on that yes sir okay yes sir any other questions of the applicant this may have been testified before but i don't recall is there a, a requirement to stay 10 feet away from this the line the yes center? on both sides but is that a requirement did someone require you to um they just said that we have to have a 10 foot setback on each side of the uh, of the series okay and that was someone from metro or who yes ma'am Is there a 10 foot setback on this? The rear? 20 on the rear? 20 on the rear, 5 on the side. I'm talking about from the. Are we. Are you confirming from the sanitary line that there's a required 10 foot? Are you talking about something else? It's 20 else? on the rear, just the rear property line. Yeah, that I understood, but the sanitary line, I was wondering if they're, if Metro made them stay a certain distance. Metro doesn't allow you to build on top of a sewer line. But they're 10 feet away from it. I was wondering how. Yeah, That's Mike. governed by the water and sewer department, and we typically don't mm -hmm. interfere, I guess would be the right way to say that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that being said, um, any other questions? Anything else? Okay. Anything else to add? Okay. We're going to. No, sir. Is there opposition here present? Nope. Oh, okay. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. City says 20 feet. They're asking for five. Well, I mean, that, you know, there was some that, that, there was a lot of opposition to it being a potential duplex, but that the city established that it was a grandfather duplex and they're allowed to have two units right. on the property. Um, I do think there's a legitimate hardship with the sewer line. Um, I do think that, and I guess the question to our own only architect on the board now is, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it, it looks like it's a four bedroom uh, carriage house. Um, and which is a, a pretty large carriage house, but it's a, you know, 32 feet deep home. And, you know, that, that to me is the question is, you know, is that, you know, is that appropriate or not? But it, it you know, given the, the neighbors, the, the rear neighbors opposition, I think at best it should be the, the furthest back as possible. I mean, if it, could, if it can be seven feet, I think it needs to be seven feet. To me, 10 is kind of the the ballpark I was had in my head to think, well, that would be, you know, reasonable. But um, but I understand that the home, you know, I'm okay with seven if, um, I, I don't, I think five may be too much. If you all think they should. I'm closer to you. Well, I'm uncomfortable with the rear neighbor still being in opposition and this directly affects them. So, um, as for this, it's hard to determine the square footage of the home. It might and be. And remember, we heard from the Council Lady Murphy in the top of the meeting, and I asked her if she was had an opinion on this particular part, and she said since it was not clear from what they presented, she wasn't really sure kind of where they were going to build or not. I think it, I mean, it's a fairly, it's probably oh, 1,600 I mean, square feet, I'm guessing. It's a, it's a 1,616 square foot total heated uh, building. The, the, First floor footprint is 776, second floor living is 840. That's on the plan. Yep. Thanks, I didn't see the plan until today, so thanks. Um, thankfully, yeah, even okay. with the reading classes and blowing it up. <laughs> so <laughs> does that change anything with you? And what would you be willing to? I don't know, I'm st I, I'd like to hear what everyone else has to say, actually. Although I think I've heard I, some I of it. I think the, the neighbor <laughs> had very strong opposition and it obviously backs up to her property very close so uh, they all showed up last time and no one showed up or wrote an additional letter so not that you have to show up but I, I do get that I think it's been heard three times yeah this might be the 
you know, to me, I mean, their, their stance stays. Um, you know, the applicant talked to the neighbors and I asked specifically about the rear neighbor and they're still in opposition, so. Um, you, you know, the I... city says 20 feet. So they're asking us for much less than that. So the question is, where is that? Well, and, and you know, I, you know, but I, I do think there is a legitimate hardship with the drain pipe. And so that, that is what would push it back. And, and like I said, but, and the you know, neighbors matter. You're right. I mean, you're right. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I had, I had, you know, I had 10 in my head, uh, but I, I, I see the plan. Well, what's that, wrong with 10 then? Well, the 10 means you'd have to, you know, re, you know, have to kind of redo the house. I mean, you have to have another plan, but. Um, it's better than 20. It's better than 20 and worse than seven. So, yeah. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy okay, to see so I, mean, I get it. Uh, Cindy, do you? And this gets. Since, Ross, since you weren't here, the, this original case, you know, I think you, you have to stay out of the voting, but Cindy, tell us what you... I really tend to agree with you. While I don't like, uh, I agree with you. I was more at 10. I think the hardship is been established because of the height. Uh, I think that the neighbors have the right to have their opinion. So I'm um, somewhere between the seven he's asking for and a 10-foot setback, but I do think he's established a hardship on that issue. Okay, so now it seems like we're deciding between seven and ten. What's that number? Does anyone have a motion? Well, I, um, actually, I was leaning for to um, not grant the request, but I could go with the ten <laughs> if someone wants to make a motion. I'll make a motion that we grant the variance uh, down to a ten-foot setback. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll, I'll second it, and, and that is, you know, only the rear setback, and know that, that there's, that no probably had originally setback. asked for a side setback, there's no side setback. Mm -hmm. yep. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes four to nothing. Thank John you, Michael. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-597 involving the property at 11 Lucille Street in Council District Number 5. As noted previously, we're joined by Council Member Scott Davis, who would like to address the board on this and other cases in his district, I'm sure. The request here in an RM20A zoning district, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial, is for proposed construction of a multifamily development, and the variance request is for a decrease in driveway size requirements. As you've now discussed in the past, Mr. Chairman, any multifamily concept typically triggers a regular commercial driveway, which is a 24-foot width. Here, with a 50-foot driveway, that would compro compose approximately 48% of the entire frontage of the street. As a result, the request is reduced from 24 to 12. The photograph of the property in its current condition in the lower right-hand corner and across the street in the upper left, you'll note this is near the end of the developed portion of Lucille Street. The view up and down the road is shown here. Uh, Erlinger Properties is the appellant. Uh, they are represented capably here at the board today. Councilman Davis, did you wish to address the BZA at the outset of the hearing? You may have stepped out for a moment. So with that, we'll invite you to introduce yourself by name and address, make the desired presentation can I, with can regard I give to the Councilman case. Davis, here he is. I was about to give Councilman Davis a speech. Councilman Davis, do you want to come up and talk about the Lucille property? I have your speech down. You know, you're for everybody in your district. They're going to do good things, good people. The individuals on the All right, individuals, the big developers, whether it be have a fancy lawyer or not. <laughs> talk to us. And you always thank the BZA, which is very nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, got to thank the BZA because, and the code staff, because y'all work, you volunteer, you know, and you don't get paid, you don't ask for pay or anything, and sometimes you'll stay here late. And so people need to understand that you don't do this just because you get kicks out of it. You do it for the love of the city. Yeah, speaking of kicks, we want to see the Titans game tonight, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in support. I apologize. I was out there on my next case with the homeowner and some of the neighbors, but we've got it all figured out. Um, I'm in support. As you know, Lucille is a very weird street, a lot of topography issues, and I'm just asking the board to um, grant their requests. And, you know, no Luffy and grant their requests, please. And I'm in support, 
And so please do whatever you can to help this young man. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Any questions for the Councilman? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record and address and why you're here. Good afternoon. Uh, James Richardson from Erlanger Properties, um, property owner at 11 Lucille Street, 37207. Um, I don't have much to add um, actually to that, but um, I think the primary reason for a 12 foot wide uh, driveway would allow us to keep the perfectly good two bedroom, uh, one bathroom property that's on the lot already. And board members, and you can see many, this is a dead end street here. How, how many units are you building? So the plan, um, we have a s slightly updated version to the one that's on the screen, but it's still in. Um, it's still being worked up to the f to the final plan, but we want to put one residential structure at the back, which would have three units in. So, how many would you have in the whole property? Um, either four or five, depending on whether this existing house was turned into two micro units or just kept as one house. So, I mean, why, so why do you, but you have eight parking spaces. That's what was confusing to me. So, we were we're why do still you have eight parking spaces for four units if they're smaller units. Are they all two bedroom units or? No, they're not actually. So the if there were two in the front house, so each one would be one unit. Right. And then the units at the back, each one would have three bedrooms in. And so, this, oh, sorry. Sorry, what, would the, what would the most number of units be that you have? The most would be five. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because the, the only, you know, the only, and, and I think you, I get the hardship, I, I get it, but the only concern I have is that we've, we had another case similar to this they wanted a 12-foot driveway and but they had an alley behind them and you know we were asking well how does a fire truck get to the back unit you know somebody's parked in the driveway they're like oh there's an alley behind it and they can come down the alley it's like oh that makes sense we gave it to them and it wasn't six months later that alley was all reclaimed and planted in nice trees right. and every time i drive by it i think how's that fire truck going to get back to that back house so i'll ask you how's that fire truck going to get to the back house if if you have a, a safety issue. Sure, so, so we've been working with a development group on the plan, which is preliminary, as I said at this stage, and we've been advised that, you know, we all believe that 12 feet <coughs> wide, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a sore throat, um, 12 feet wide would be sufficient for that fire truck to get back. And, no, and but the, if there's a car parked blocking that, is, it, is there gonna be no parking all the way back? That there would, on the dr driveway itself, there would be no parking. It's just the spaces that have been allocated. Um, well, and, right and you do have more. I mean, that's a, one of the reasons you have. You've had eight, eight spaces is more than you need for four mm -hmm. units if they're all uh, one and two bedroom units. So you've got spaces for all of the residents. So there wouldn't, there's not a natural place for people to park. But um, but does that make that, sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it makes okay. sense. But like, but that is that is a concern on on adding multifamily in the back of, of a unit is, is access to safety access. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. Discussion. Uh, to me, that on this one, the, the number of parking spaces provided uh, alle uh, alleviates that concern. But I do think uh, alleviates the safety concern. Yeah, but sure yeah, and, yeah, the safety concern in terms of, of not uh, anticipating a situation where the driveway is blocked. Yeah. But I do think it. Uh, if we if we approve the variance, it would be I think he said three units in the back, maybe two in the front. I would say yeah. uh, that the variance is approved as long as there's no more than five units on the property. Okay. One thing I, we didn't call for opposition. There's there anyone here in opposition in this case? No. Okay. Um, so you're fine with it as long as it's just yeah. five units. As long as there's no more than five units on the property. Okay. And then if, if he if he wants to put more units on it, he's got to come back and ask about it. What do you think? I think it's fine as long as maybe we could get Public Works to sign off on it. I don't know if they're part of the sign-off submission. On yeah. If they would be part okay. of this. Okay, they, they will. That being said, does anyone have a motion? Well, I'll move that we approve the uh, variance request uh, in driveway size, uh, provided that their, uh, the applicant uh, has no more than five units on the property. Uh, and, and provides the uh, 10 parking spaces that's shown on the... Were there 10 on here? Yeah, well, there's two in the front, okay. uh, three spaces, five spaces. Eight. So okay, very good. Five, eight, ten. Yep, yeah. okay. Motion's been made properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you for your time. John Michael.
The next case is 2018-604, involving the property at 216 North 9th Street, also Applicant in Council 604, Edition please 5. Come forward. Chelsea Hanna is the appellant on behalf of Urban Dwell Homes, the owner of the property. <laughs> this is an RM20 zone property, just like uh, similar to the last one, not an A district, but an RM20 district shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial at the intersection of North 9th Street and Smiley Street in East Nashville. The request is for a sidewalk variance. You have in your packet the recommendation from the planning department. We are joined again by Councilman Scott Davis from Council District Number 5. The site plan submitted shows the proposed layout for the construction at this location. The photographs from a recent site visit show the face of the property, the view across Councilman the street. Davis, you're up again. The view up and down. Is there any opposition to this case? Okay, we're Councilman Davis, do you want to say anything about this case on 9th? The floor is yours. We have a sidewalk request. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I believe this is one of the cases that we had, you know, to defer because we were short memory a member because of our passing of our good friend. Um, I'm in support. Um, certain areas, the sidewalk's a little older. Other parts of this area, the sidewalks are a little bit a little bit newer. Councilman you know, Davis, this looks like sidewalks built in the late Mayor Fulton administration. But if you, but, but if you go, we had a discussion last time. But if you go to the second or the first slide, there's there's some that were built in the in the Dean and Barry administration, like right there. Okay. You know, but also the the wall makes it very difficult. Yes. And I know the neighbors don't want the wall removed. You know, so. You know, just to be fair. So you're asking us to approve this variance and keep the sidewalk and not pay into the fund? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. Testing that Ewing doctrine. Okay. Anything else to add? Do you agree with the planning recommendation that he would have to maintain uh, the existing sidewalk and replace anything that is not ADA compliant? I'm old. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Any other questions for the councilman? Thank you for being here again. Please identify yourself for the record, name, address, why you're here. I am Zach Wolpart. I reside at 2717 Saturn Drive. Okay. Um, I am the engineer on the project. Okay. Um, I chose so to hand them. So we've heard about the wall. What kind of shape are these sidewalks in, and what are you proposing? Uh, um, just as it was said, uh, we don't want to affect the sidewalks or the wall that's there. Um, you know, if it comes down to them needing to be maintained in any way, okay. I don't think we're opposed now, to that. My board member over here is probably not going to vote for you unless you have some sort of compromise or something that you're going to add to this situation. So yeah. just paying nothing is not going to be acceptable to her. Is there anything you have to add? Uh, I do not. Okay. Any questions of the applicant? Did you, um, I think at one point there was some question about the ADA compliant. Uh, you know, request and, you know, about polls or something. Did, did you all do any uh, thought or research between the last hearing and this hearing about uh, what might be involved and whether or not you'd be willing to make this, uh, that I think that corner ADA compliant? Um, I have not um, heard anything on that. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. Well, I, I, I appreciate the the Ewing uh, perspective, doctrine, whatever you want to call it. Um, I do tend to think that if in the case like this, where the uh, planning department recommends that they uh, maintain the current uh, sidewalk and bring you know the corner into ADA compliance, that uh, that that expense to me is is enough to, to warrant to, to, to waive the in-lieu fee. Yeah, let's reopen this, Ken. In Mr. Engineer here. Yes, sir. All planning is saying just just make this corner ADA. Yeah. It's not but, a lot of money. Well, yeah, but, they're that also, be... but they're also saying they want them to pay, too. They're going to pay on that. But right. if you want to go vote over here, <laughs> you got to throw something here. Yeah. Would you I, be willing to make that ADA? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that yeah. would be, that would be a, not a problem to my client at all. Uh, okay, very yeah. good. Close public hearing again. <laughs> so okay. I'd, I'd be willing to support variance, um, provided they maintain the existing sidewalk and repair it as needed, um, maintain it in good condition, and 
um, make the corner yeah, ADA. Yeah, any I think that well the the specific any portion of the existing sidewalk along the property frontage that's not ADA compliant is to be removed and replaced with uh, in kind MPW detailed sidewalk. And the, the base, the is that ADA, that little kind of I think those yellow strips with the dots in it? That's what I have those, in my mind, but okay. I wouldn't have any. Idea. Okay, I think that's what that is. Okay, so that I, I think that's what that is. Okay. But that's, so that's your motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, we still didn't get our vote. But I know, but we gave you something. Oh, congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Go for it. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-616, involved in the property at 221 38th Avenue North in Council District Number 24. You heard from Council Member Murphy with regard to this property earlier. It's an RS 7.5 single-family zone district. John Stambitz is the appellant for a sidewalk variance on this case, as discussed previously by the Council Member. As you see here from the aerial photograph, this is the next to last residential lot before you get to the raw road on this section of 38th. The site plan submitted shows the proposed layout for the residential construction. Photographs from the recent site visit show the area, both uh, the property in question and the view directly across the street, then the view up and down 38th at that location, which is noted to have no sidewalk as it heads careening uh, toward the dead end. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 616? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just please introduce yourself by name and address. Ladies and gentlemen of the PZA, thank you for hearing me today. My name is John Staubitz. I live at 221 38th Avenue North. I'm the property owner. I'm here today because I don't want to have to tear down that historic stone wall. Uh, that is a, it's a beautiful wall. It's been there for a long time, and we've built our garden around that wall. Um, I have a quote in hand from a mason who says, I can tear down that wall, which is what I'm going to have to do in order to build a compliant sidewalk. He okay. said that'll cost $5,100 for him to do that. Um, mm -hmm. We have been asked to pay in lieu of fee of $9,100. So I, I am faced with two options. I can tear down that wall and build a compliant sidewalk for $5,100, or I can pay the in lieu of fee. So I'm here today to ask you for a reduction from the board from the $9,100 to the $5,100 fee that would match what my cost would be to uh, remedy the sidewalk to the satisfaction of planning. Okay, we heard from your duly elected council person, Council A. Murphy, earlier, and she said that you should not have to build a new sidewalk. She did not have an opinion about not paying the new fee, or at least did not state it to us. So um, questions for the applicant about what he has just said. He says he does not want to pe tear down the wall, but he says his quote to tear down the wall and build a new sidewalk is 5000 and the fee is 9000 So he's asking not to pay the in lieu fee or less. Why can't you build a sidewalk in front of the wall? So it, I'm not sure if it's if it's visible from this photograph. It may be more visible from the site plan, but our understanding is that um, in regrading the uh, uh, the strip of, of grass there, that we'd have to level that when we take the dirt out. The support for the wall would be gone. There wouldn't be enough dirt to hold that wall up anymore. And so as that foundation crumbles, the wall would would basically have to be torn out and <coughs> reconstructed. That's a good question. So the wall is in front of that car, that black car up yeah, here? Yes, sir. The, the wall also is visible. It's like a, a light colored strip. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. What, what is, why is that wall only on that property? What makes it historic? So um, when was the wall it's built? Part of the existing structure? It, it, it's a pre-war wall. That the house, the original home was built there in 1940. Okay, I, so I'm, it's tied it, to that home. It's it, not, down the whole street. It's specific to your home. It's there. There is a matching wall that is, um, and the, uh, uh, so actually, if you go back to the photos we just saw, um, so to the, there's a house in the lower right hand corner. You see the small white house. There's, there's a wall that matches it that starts in front of the property. You, you see half of that house. There are three lots there at 216, uh, 38th. It runs across those three properties. Um, 
uh, many years ago, there was one house that sat on those three, pro three, lot, three lots of split, and there was actually only one house on our lot and the one next to it. Ours was a single lot that it was split long before our time. Okay, so does that make sense, board members? So you're saying if you, if you left the wall there and built the sidewalk the way you'd have to build the sidewalk, the foundation of the wall would not be supported? We've been told that by engineers who've looked at it, yes, sir. Okay, uh, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, uh, we'll close the public hearing. So discussion, let's start off. So John Michael, can you put the overhead shot up? So this is a dead end to a railroad track, which obviously the railroad's not moving anywhere. And, you know, they're talking about building sidewalks. So the council lady doesn't want him to have to build a sidewalk, but was silent on the issue of the Enlou fund. Um, given the dead end street and the historic wall, I would be leaning to let him out of the Enlou fund and building the sidewalk. What are your thoughts? Well, I tend to agree with that. However, it is uh, somewhat offensive to me that we have a council person who will not take a position on whether or not this person should have to pay into the in lieu fund and puts it on us when the council has passed that uh, unanimously that if you are not going to build, then you have to pay into the fund. And they have set those fees in a way that building is typically more palatable than paying into the fund. So it, I think it really puts us in a bind. I agree with preserving the historic nature. I don't like it that it should hurt individual builders, but if you make a motion, I will tend to agree with you. Okay, well, I'll make a motion that I, we- I agree with your, with your uh, opinion all the way around. I make a motion that we approve case 616 um, to give them a variance of the sidewalk requirements and because of the historic nature of the wall and the fact that if a sidewalk was built, it would undermine the structure and engineering of the wall. And this is literally one house away from a dead end street. And so, and, and, and so therefore I'd also say that they get a variance from paying into the uh, sidewalk fund. That's my motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Four to one. Okay, good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, our next case is 2018-635. This involves a property at 927 Woodland Street. The request before you today is for a variance from the sidewalk requirements in this, the commercial services. Will the applicant of 635 please come forward now? Jesse Bushnell is the appellant on behalf of the ownership group that owns this property. As noted previously, this is a property that was before you, I want to say just a few months ago, with regard to a request for a variance from the required parking count. Namely, there was an attempt to preserve the 11, I believe it was 11, parking spaces shown there in the aerial photograph here on the site plan and in the upper left hand corner here for the pull in parking at that location. Now, because the sidewalks are triggered as well for this project, the sidewalks would necessarily go right in place of those 11 parking spaces, which are the subject of your last appeal, thus the request before you today. Do we know why this wasn't triggered before? Uh, we'll have to let the appellant speak to that, Mr. Chair Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, again, Jesse Bushnell is the appellant. Is there any opposition present for case 635? I know there's the one gentleman previously. That's you, cousin. Anybody else? That's it. As a result, we'll have 10 minutes for the presentation from the appellants. They're welcome to save back any portion of that time they might wish for their rebuttal. Then we'll hear from the opponents thereafter, and there'll be 10 minutes for the opponents to speak as well. Uh, if you'll just introduce yourselves by name and address, please. Hi there. I am uh, Jesse Bushnell, and I am um, a real estate agent and um, working What's your with address? What's that? What's your address? Um, uh, 401 Valeria Court. Okay. Yeah. And you? Yes, I'm Peter Obermeyer. 
927 Woodland Street, property owner 37206. Okay, why are you all here? Well, first of all, I want to thank the board uh, for approving the parking for 927 Woodland Street variance in September. Uh, we've got a very large building uh, and only have 11 parking spaces. Uh, if we lost those 11 parking spaces for a building of that size, it would have been oppressive. So if you built the sidewalk as the city is requiring, how many spaces would you lose? All of them. All of them? Yes, sir. How is that? So it would just be... Because they're all out front. Okay. And if you put a curb up there, there would be no, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to pull into the property. Yeah, uh, and why was this not part of the original appeal? Had you not gotten your building permit? I or agree what? with you. It, it should have been. I don't, I don't know why uh, we did okay. not have it as a so part that's, of that. That's, that's your situation. Any questions for the applicant? Mr. Obermeyer, I think I represented you several years ago. Did I not? I, I'm sorry for. I, I'm Ross Pepper. Were you a client of mine? Yes. So, okay. Yes. I, I, Hello, Ross. I think I'm probably good Congratulations to see you. I think I'm probably on you being. Better. Yeah. Okay. I better stay out of this one. This okay. Your recusal. Fly, so. And, so and Mr. You. Chairman, as we typically advise with our board members, in the event of the need to recuse, we ask the board member to step outside while that case is underway, and uh, we'll come okay, get you for the next one. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's opposition, so would I recommend that you go back in the audience and you'll have eight minutes and 30 seconds of rebuttal. We're going to hear from the opposition and you'll come back and well, do respond. I Do I have a chance to of say course. a couple things? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I don't know if y'all have copies, but you probably should. Um, the planning department has recommended. Yes. Uh, you do have that. And do you have the, uh, the letter from uh, the councilman? Um, uh, Mr. Withers? Yes. yes, we do. Okay, very okay. good. Just want to make sure okay. you very good. So please go back in the audience. Opposition, please come forward. State your name, address, why you're opposed to this request. Good afternoon, Brandon Brown. I represent uh, the Tennessee Disability Coalition at 955 Woodland Street. Um, our opposition to the variance request uh, here is uh, because we are a disability organization, we certainly have um, concerns about uh, ADA compliance. We want to make sure that in every situation, uh, particularly this case since it's right down the street from our offices where many people with disabilities um, patron, that um, you know, we're providing every and, and the highest level of accessibility. Um, I would say that that includes not only on Woodland Street, but down at the corner of McFerrin as well, uh, where there are not, you know, we want to make sure that the sidewalks are well maintained and that there are no obstructions. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that in whatever case, uh, in this case particularly, that the sidewalk is either uh, built to code that they're paying into the fund or they're willing to maintain it as is because that is what needs to be happening. And I would say, just as an aside, that needs to happen in all sidewalk cases. So when when you say, um, and, and the planning department is, is recommended that we approve the request in part because the the, the case bef that we had previously, which you know, said, you know, the, the way this building is set, it's just, it's a strange, uh, the setting on the lot, it's right up on the, the side set back and the only parking that it has is the existing parking and and I think everybody in the neighborhood, the council members and the planning department had recommended before that you know, we allow them to keep it, which we did. And so now when they are actually doing their work, they're having to, you know, change the sidewalk and that's why we're hearing it basically a second time. <clears throat> but the planning department says, you know, approve it, but the assumption would be that they would have to maintain it and and just one of your options was saying you're all you're okay with it if if they you know maintain it in good as is in good condition or is because that right now it's a curb cut it's not a sidewalk right it's a well it has a, it has concrete on us it has a concrete sidewalk before it goes into see it right there it says on the four lease it's got a sidewalk but but you can cross it to it get looks into like the one big curb cut except one that one little section near the the one-way sign so that's just one big curb cut I mean I guess the, the question is it, it's is this, are, are, is this property reasonably in good shape now, or is there is there work that they would need to do to improve the sidewalk? Um, well, I, I would I would mention that there's uh, one large um, utility pole uh, that um, 
is an obstruction of that makes it less than 36 inches across uh, right in front of their property. So I, I would, I'm not sure if that's in the purview of this committee or not, but I would say that that certainly doesn't meet um, the standards right. of ADA compliance. Um, again, as long as those compliance standards are in force and should not take a back seat to Right. You know, the, the situation of how the property is situated, uh, that's something that we can be in favor of. But when those compliance standards are um, given variance okay. because of a situation yep. um, right. of that, so I, that's something we, we are, are cannot be in Are you comfortable with this curb cut that basically runs the length of a building the way it is today? Well, I, I think there's there's a question of comfortability or, or what is uh, part of code. Because a curb cut is not a sidewall. You understand that. I do. It's just coming in and out. And so what the city would require under the new sidewalk ordinance is for them to build a sidewalk and be wide, and they would lose every single parking spaces in this building. So is there some sort of compromise that you see the improving and strengthening this for ADA, but allowing them to keep parking spaces. <clears throat> I, I think that would be a um, a question at, for uh, not only planning, but also in consultation with the ADA compliance office. I, my, I, I wonder, as part of this process, and that's something I, I I ask you all is is if the ADA compliance office is signed off on this, or do they right. sign off any of the, these kind of requests? I don't believe they do. So, John, the, the poll that you mentioned is not owned by the applicant. I'm assuming it's an NES poll or an uh, AT&T sure. poll. And it looks like there's another poll a little bit further down the road, also kind of in the same position. That happens a lot in, in that area, I must say. So, you know, I'm not sure where that poll could be moved, you know, given that it's kind of now part of this network and it is sort of close to the street. And it does not seem that you could kind of move the pole closer into on the property, given the kind of the way the lines work. So I'm not sure if we have a lot of say in that either. And, and you may not. That may not be the purview. I, I just wanted to make mention of that um, yes. as an issue. Yeah. No, I appreciate you being here and, and raising those kind of qu questions, because that's very important to, you know, accessibility, walkability, everything. Well, I'd be, I'd be willing to, you know, ask that they bring that corner up to full ADA compliance. Too. I mean, that's something that looks like could be done yeah. reasonably minimally. Here with the Absolutely. The one-way sign, that could have kind of an ADA cut corner, and that sign looks like it's kind of obstructing, so that sign could be shifted over yes, to sir. make a little bit better access to cross the street there. I think that's a reasonable request. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions for the opposition? Nope. Thank you for no, being thank, here. Thank you. Let's hear from the applicant again. This is rebuttal time. You get to respond to what you heard. And um, like I said, I think it's a re reasonable request to work with the city to move that street sign and then do an ADA uh, curb cut there on that little sidewalk area that doesn't affect your parking. What do you ADA think of that? First corner. of all, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just said, an ADA compliant corner, right? First of all, <clears throat> there's nothing about anything we do there that would, we would be against ADA <coughs> compliance. Uh, that's something that's important to me. Uh, I've had family members that have uh, been in wheelchairs permanently, and uh, I understand. Um, the, uh, the corner, pro I'm sure, would be no problem, uh, as well as I, I would point out that the drive parking, excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold, mm -hmm. the uh, parking area in front of that uh, pole is a deep portion of the parking lot. And it's also smooth and level to that uh, uh, sidewalk area. So there's no reason that someone can't swerve into that parking area there, uh, which gives it width. Even though it's a different color, it is level. Okay. So I, I don't know how and that obviously applies. Obviously, when you redo this parking lot, it looks like there might be some traces of a handicapped parking space there, but there's going to be at least probably one handicapped oh, parking sure. space. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm confident of that. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Any other questions for the applicant? No. Okay. Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. Thank you. I, I think it's a fair request. I mean, the, the planning, to, but, we, but when we've already, we've already addressed the parking piece of it in another hearing. And, you know, I think that given that in the planning department's recommendation for approval, um, and especially, you know, the, uh, 
the, the neighbors, uh, you know, I think legitimate request. I mean, I'll, I'll yeah. move that we approve the uh, parking variance uh, with uh, no payment into the fund on the advice of the planning department, provided that the applicant uh, bring the corner uh, of the property to full ADA compliance. Right, and if that means moving the street sign to work with Public Works to do that yeah, too whatever, as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, motion's been made and I'll second it. Uh, discussion. Well, I'll say you all are probably gonna wonder how I'm gonna vote and I'm usually very consistent with the planning department and the very rare occasion that they recommended approval and I appreciate that you're you. working, you're suggesting to get some ADA compliance in this area, so that means the applicant's doing something to better um, the public good. Okay. Um, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. And thank you so much. To the neighbor, thank you for being here and speaking out for the ADA. Much appreciate what y'all be do. Because that's very important, and, and you're a neighbor, and we need to hear more, and please work with your council people because when we re rewrite these sidewalk rules and all this, ADA needs to be front and center. Brett's so. been great uh, uh, to deal with. Uh, so. he's, he's really super, and he's been very kind and very fair. He supports what we're doing. So. And we've done everything you know, with his guidance. So. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. John Michael, next case. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-637. This involves a property at 2251 Winford Avenue in Council District Number 17. It's a two-part request, first for a variance from sidewalk requirements and from certain among the building requirements for animal boarding facilities in this in IWD zoning district. The property shown here right at the end of Winford as it crosses over Longview right before 440 is the subject property. The aerial photograph gives you a sense of the layout of the property in its current condition. The proposal would be to locate at that location, or rather to uh, develop the animal boarding facility uh, project at that location. The subject property here, a uh, little right hand corner I believe, and then the view across the street in the upper, view up and down the street at this location. So again, it's a request for a variance from the sidewalk requirements, and this the IWD zoning district to convert this space into an animal <coughs> boarding facility, but also from certain among the building requirements under 17.16.070, B as in boy, part one, in order to get that approval as well. Again, the appellant is Catherine Randolph. Uh, the appellants are present. Are there any opponents to 637 present today? So no John Michael, is present, remind a five minute presentation. this is a sidewalk case and what else are we determining today? While he's looking at that, please introduce your name, name address. And, I'm Jack, uh, you're Jack Bergman, 802 Longview Avenue. Okay. And I'm Catherine Randolph, 802 Longview Avenue, which is property adjacent to this corner property. Okay. May but, I ask, what do your shirts say? I can't read them. <laughs> I'm just here. Okay. Um, we're wanting to... Um, Open up a, uh, a doggy daycare. A doggy daycare. What does that mean? And, well, it, it would be a place where you could bring your dog uh, for the day. Is that overnight too, or no? Huh? Pardon me. Is it overnight or just? Yes, yeah, we'll have boarding also. Yeah. Well, okay. have boarding. And how many and what kind of facility are you going to have for them? Top notch. Um, right now we have like 29 kennels that we bought. Um, we've got plenty of room. We're going to have uh, astral turf all over the place, swimming pools. <laughs> um, so, wait, are you going to tear down the, the existing structures and... and no, 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 the, the, the structure that's down, we're renovating inside. Um, I have a dental lab uh, there now, okay. and I'm, I'm ready to quit doing that. Okay. After 55 years, so... Wow. Um, so this is in an industrial area, so there's nobody here in opposition. To, what do your neighbors think of this proposal? Uh, we don't have neighbors other than industrial. Uh, a lot of noise. Uh, we, we so back up to, what kind of noise do you have over there? <laughs> we back up to 440. That's a lot of noise. I can list, we can sit in the backyard and listen to the races. Okay, the what, else, what other noisemakers you got over there? Uh, uh, go ahead. The, uh, just across Longview Avenue, um, 
that's a place where they come in and out with trucks all the time and, and uh, okay. loading and unloading. I don't know what. Front loaders, back loaders. A lot so of beeping noise. So you, you've owned this property for a while? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, the, uh, I mean there, there were two letters of opposition. One was for, oh. I think, sidewalks. Um, a, a kind of a generic sidewalk opposition letter. The other one was, uh, it said, I'm requesting that the, the, the plan, or understand the plan uses of the properties for animal boarding, and I'm asking you not to allow that. The property's in blighted condition is not compatible to the neighborhood. So I, I'm, I'm curious to know just kind of what improvements you are planning on the property. And I mean, from here, I mean, you, you see a lot of trucks and other things in the property. How, how are you gonna improve the property? Well, the trucks will be gone. We're not- we're And the trailers will be gone. Yeah, we've been renting that to a guy that's uh, a rigger, uh, hauls printing presses and stuff. So he'll be gone. Um, like I said, we're gonna have astral turf in the back. We're gonna have eight foot fences all around. Um, uh, the building itself is pretty big. Like I said, I have a dental lab there now, and half of it, and that'll be gone. I'm, I'm gonna okay. shut that down. Uh, Any other questions for the applicant? John Michael, did you get the answer to what this case really is? Yeah, as noted in your docket, it's the section of applicable law is 17.16.070, which has to do with uh, uh, permitted conditions uses in uh, you know, commercial nature, specifically section B deals with these animal boarding facilities. The setback requirements get into um, the distance from residences. And of course we see in the aerial here, you've got another, a number of other commercial properties nearby, but as we can see here, it's pointed out by our zoning examiner, one of our, probably our most experienced, most thorough zoning examiner, <laughs> that you have a number of residential plots here, or uh, lots here in the immediate area, lot number 210, lot number uh, to 13 also residences closer than 200 feet. So the need for the variance is from that specific condition under 17.16.070, uh, only with that variance would they then meet the requirements as far as that section of the uh, code goes. So we're giving them a variance to operate this kind of facility and then they're asking for a sidewalk variance. Is that well, uh, may I say something? Um, I, let me ask, let me. To the answer to your question is that, uh, granting that variance would give them permission to operate the facility closer to a residential property okay. than would otherwise be allowed. And then they're also asking for a sidewalk variance? Correct. Okay. I don't know of any other residences. We, we live next door. We're so the one that's 200 feet away. Yeah. And we so, so what's over there is mainly industrial, but some right. are zoned residential. That's what we're saying. So, so you're, no. you're saying there's there's a house that's 169 feet away, and you're saying that's your house? We live there, right. But no, we're in the uh, almost... Okay. But there's, but there's no opposition, and but we're, that's one of the things we have to consider. And I wanted to ask about the variance, the sidewalk. We didn't yeah. really ask for that. Mm -hmm. the, guy, the gentleman at Codes put that in. He okay. just put it in. Um, the Would planning you be willing to pay into the fund? We'll need it. We'll need. Oh, we, you want a sidewalk? Yes, we okay. want. A, well, we want uh, an opening on either side where we're going to have drop off the dogs okay. on one side, yeah. pick them up on the other. We we'll need enough and you'll room. You'll be walking dogs, I imagine, too. A little. No, mm. no, inside the inside the fence, we will. We'll have a dog okay. run. Okay. Um, any other questions for the applicant? Well, so, so planning is recommending that you maintain along Winford and you construct on Longview Avenue, and you're agreeable to that. Yes, yes. ma'am. I, I would like to speak to someone that I, I really don't know how long the sidewalk would have to be. We need uh, openings for cars to come in and out, um, but whatever sidewalk we have to put up, we'll do it. Okay. 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 Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, let's close the public hearing. Discussion? Well, the, the biggest difference between this case and other animal boarding slash kennel cases is that the, the homeowner that is impacted is the applicant. Yes, and there's no opposition. The, uh, and there, there's no opposition. And it sounds like that the, they have just agreed to the planning recommendations because planning didn't have them pay if they just had them build, maintain one side and build On the, the front. other. Yep, so do we have a motion? Well, I, I'll move that we uh, approve the variance, uh, the distance requirement for the animal boarding facility um, variance, and that the uh, sidewalk variance is also approved given uh, the conditions of the planning department. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Are you, are you willing to amend it to say the reason for the 
motion variance includes the fact that we don't have opposition. We are in, there are no other residences, although there are some zoned residential areas, and it's in the right in the, by 440, where I think the noise, even if it were to be an issue, it's. Well, I think all, the, all those are important and should be included. I appreciate that. And that the, uh, and specifically that the testimony was that the, the home that is needing that 31 foot variance is the applicant's home. Right. That, that their home is the one that triggered that uh, okay. that distance requirement, and, and that makes us unique. Okay. So that's the motion. Do you second that? Thank you. I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank, Thank you for you. being Thank here. You. John hey, Michael. Bring your, bring your, bring your dogs, because they probably won't want to come home. <laughs> Okay, it's John Michael. Mr. Chairman, two announcements with regard to cases appearing later on our docket. First, case 2018-645, involving the property at 935 East Trinity Lane had been previously approved on the consent agenda. However, there seems to have been some miscommunication about that being pinned to compliance with the Planning Department's recommendations with regard to the sidewalk variance. As a result, um, they do not wish to go along with those and would wish to have a uh, hearing. However, because we've already dismissed the matter, uh, we would probably, just for technicality's sake, need to have a motion to set aside approved here, have it set to a later date so that any opponents who might have been here to speak in opposition okay. could be here to do so. So we will move 645 off the consent agenda and hear it at the a later date, most likely the next meeting. Is that fine? Okay, that's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. So case we'll 645 will be heard at our next <coughs> board meeting on December the 20th. Mr. Chairman, we also want to announce that case 2018-677 involving the property at 1112 Wade Avenue in Council District Number 17 uh, stands in need of a deferral and is asked to defer two meetings to our uh, hilariously light January the 3rd docket. Yeah, I think that makes it the 12th case on that blissfully oh, short man. docket, Mr. Chairman. This is like 2012 <laughs> dockets. Recession right. dockets, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, 677 will be heard on January the 3rd. That brings us up then to our next regularly scheduled case, which I believe is 2018-639. This uh, BZA case involves a property at 476 McMurray Drive. You heard from Council Member Devette Blaylock previously with regard to this. It is a church, namely the St. Mina Coptic Orthodox Church, shown here with their area on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial. The appeal is two-part. It is for a special exception for the religious institution use on residentially zoned property and their new construction projects that they're pursuing. Also, a variance from sidewalk requirements in this, the R10 zoning district in conjunction with their new construction. The site plan submitted give you a sense of the proposed construction at this location. The view of the church in the upper left-hand corner and uh, property across the street, another religious institution in the lower right there. And the views of the sidewalks and street frontages along this area in all the affected areas. Of note, uh, the planning department has submitted their recommendation, uh, rather traditional extension, to, or non-traditional rather, recommendations involving an extension of the five-foot sidewalk around the corner, uh, dedication of right-of-way on both McMurray and Cherrywood. As noted, you previously heard from the council member and her general support of this project. The appellants are present. Um, and it's my understanding that they are agreeable to the terms recommended by the planning department with regard to the sidewalk component. The, st the special exception, of course, is the traditional analysis that we've applied in all the cases under 17.16 of the zoning code with regard to religious institution use on residentially zoned properties. Boutros Boutros is the named appellant. The church is the owner of the subject property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 639? There is. As a result, we will invite the um, appellants to introduce themselves by name and address. You'll have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. If you want to hold some portion of that time back for rebuttal, it should come out of this originally allocated 10 minutes. Next, we would hear from the opponents. So again, if you'll just introduce yourselves and make the presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Father Boutros. I'm the priest of St. Mina Coptic Orthodox Church located at 476 McMurray Drive. Nashville, Tennessee, 37211, since uh, February of 1997. Uh, we are today applying for a permit to enlarge the sanctuary to accommodate our current needs, and we do not expect an additional parishioners. We currently have uh, parishioners standing outside in the hallways and in the other room uh, next to the church. The new expansion uh, should upgrade the, uh, the old existing building of the church and will give a, a better curbside appeal. 
Um, I know that there is some opposition from the, the neighbors, and uh, I'm ready to uh, reply. And we actually took uh, measure, measurements to, to uh, solve these uh, problems. So, uh, so the, the council member had said that that you all had agreed at, uh, I guess you all had a public meeting, right, to talk about Yes, we this, did. And that you all um, had agreed to uh, do okay. your your part to enforce no parking on Cherrywood Street, and, and you were okay with that being? I would say on one side of the street will be fine, the side of the, 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 the church itself. On the other side, it will be okay. Okay. So you so you only want no parking on one side of the street, not both sides of the street? I, I would say this will, will work. Well, why, why not both sides of the street? That's what the council person seemed to. Well, I think this, uh, because uh, because the Coptic community, we are uh, about 5,000 families in Nashville. Yes. And we're served with eight locations in Nashville. But this is the oldest church, and uh, as Egyptians, if we have funerals, if we have weddings, if we have uh, occasions like this, people come from all these eight yes. locations to attend. So, so some occasions <coughs> will have extra parking. So if, uh, if, the, uh, if we prevented parking from one side of the street, I think this will be sufficient for uh, emergency traction. So, so there are a few people here in opposition. I imagine we're going to hear about parking and some Definitely, other things yes. too. So, yes. um, you know, they might say, that one side street's okay, but they also might say that no. So how much parking do you allow, or are you capable of parking on your property? How many? We have adequate uh, parking according to code on site. Well, how many and is then, that? Uh, 214 or 215, okay. something like that. On the other side of the street, we have uh, created a, an off-site parking uh, that what do you mean you've created? I mean, is that I city mean, park? Oh, yeah, yeah. City yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, has over 125 parking spaces also on the other side. On the street? No. No, no, no. Off, off, off site. Okay, okay so off you have like, another parking lot that exactly, you yes. have contracted with that your right. members can park there. Okay. So, how many parking spaces do you really need? <coughs> According to codes, 215. Oh, I know, but be, yeah. you, I mean, um, between the on-site and off-site mm -hmm. parking, we have enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have more than enough. Questions for the applicant? I had a note in our file that you agreed to um, the planning department's recommendations for the sidewalks. Is that yes, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And we continue, and I, I think I've heard some of these cases before, we still have complaints from neighbors about a lack of greenery, uh, lack of maintenance of the surrounding buildings. I assume we're going to hear that from them, but I'd like to hear your... Yeah, I was going to leave that till, uh, till last, but uh, actually uh, we took measurements to uh, Measure. resolve, or measures to uh, um, resolve these problems. Uh, as far as parking, um, we have the uh, off-site parking, which is sufficient. The, the, uh, the church houses, we are going to, we already cleaned all the shrubberies and, and the trees and cut the branches and stuff like that according to the recommendations. But uh, also we're going to work on the, uh, the appearance of the houses, or the paint and stuff like that. We're going to work on that. Uh, as far as uh, they have complained about cutting trees, we don't cut trees for no reason because cutting trees actually, as you know, is a very expensive uh, thing to do. But um, uh, we cut dead, dead trees, and when tree cause a hazard to a house. For example, last, last summer, a neighbor called and, and wanted the, tr the tree to be cut down. It cost us $1,200 to cut it because she was afraid that it was going to hurt her house if she fall on the house. It, so, it, it also seems like there's, yeah, I think one of the letters that we got said um, that at the previous hearing, um, for, I mean, y'all are y'all come here a lot because you're growing and you're always changing and, yes. and doing things. Thank God. But at one of the pre previous hearings, it said that that um, that you all said that part of the plan would be substantial greenery suggested by the Division of Urban Forestry that would front McMurray Drive, and that there hasn't been any shrubbery or greenery, you know, between the parking lot and McMurray Drive. We did actually plant trees along the uh, Cherrywood and McMurray Drives, but uh, McMurray Drive, but uh, some of them did not 
you know, uh, live, that they died from the freeze. But actually, as of this morning, we planted more trees uh, along McMurray uh, Drive. How many did you plant? Uh, eight trees. Okay. Yeah. You're worried about the freeze on those? Well, uh, actually, I, I really I apologize that we did not replace them before, but uh, actually, hopefully this is the these time are of year it's yeah. proper to plant trees. These are much bigger trees, and, and uh, so I hope they are going to survive. And okay. um, anything else to add before we hear from the opposition from you two? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's hear from the opposition. Please come forward. You'll have 10 minutes collectively, so divide your time equally. You do not have to take 10 minutes if you do not wish to, but please state your name, your address, why you're opposed to this. My name is Kay Ayers. I live at 506 Highcrest Drive, just around the corner from the church. I have owned this property for over three years. I have lived in the neighborhood for over 10. Uh, I'm opposed to the expansion of the church given uh, safety issues uh, and concerns with walkability. Uh, we have a lot of young uh, families moving into the area and we're seeing a lot of people on the streets. The existing plans are bringing the church very close to Cherrywood itself and I believe it's going to hinder the visibility from people turning off and on uh, McMurray onto Cherrywood. We've had numerous accidents over the years uh, of car accidents, pedestrians being hit. There's even been a fatality. Um, that was before I had moved into the neighborhood. Um, we know that parking issues currently exist and the expansion of the church is gonna create even more parking issues. I know they don't anticipate uh, gathering any more parishioners, but it's, it's inevitable. Uh, it's continuing to grow. The amount of traffic uh, and the pass through onto Cherry Wood has uh, not allowed emergency vehicles in the past to get through. In 2014, they were asked to put up no parking signs. Um, and all of this has just happened within the last week. The trees being planted, the shrubs being replaced, the no parking signs being put up because they're coming in front of the board today. But that was in 2014 when this was addressed. There's been multiple codes violations over the years. The most recent uh, was a permit that was not filed for expansion of a parking lot. And that was in January of 2018. They purchased residential properties and turned the yards into concrete parking lots to um, create more parking for the parishioners. Um, and they're continuing to do this. I did have some discussion with them about tearing down trees. Uh, a couple of those properties were uh, in the properties behind my existing property. Uh, I have photographs and I have video of them tearing down the trees that day. Uh, there was only one dead tree that needed to be cut down and they cut down a few of them. I think there's a lot of poor planning and going on with the expansion of the building itself. ADA uh, handicapped parking places that exist along Cherrywood um, it's, it's right on the street. You're gonna have cars coming out of a, of a handicapped parking place, cars coming around the corner from McMurray onto Cherrywood, and this is going to create a very dangerous situation, not only for the pedestrians, but mostly for the vehicles. So my issues are really just poor planning, parking issues that already exist, um, dilapidated structures that they own, they don't take care of, trash is constantly visible. <laughs> We've uh, addressed this, the neighbor, uh, several neighbors have addressed this with them on numerous occasions, I'm not the only one. During a heavy down, uh, a downpour, many of the, uh, the, uh, the items of trash that are in the yards that are part of the school property are in the creek and get washed down to the other neighbors. They're forced to go out and clean up this mess. They've addressed this over the years. It's still not being taken care of. So uh, this is my opinion, so I'll let uh, a couple of other people. I have a question for you. you yes. Um, I don't see a site plan in our board packet, and so I'll ask the applicant when they come back up. But where is your understanding of where the additions will be? Do you have a drawing or something you can show? Uh, I believe they were on the drawings that were on originally. Uh, I had copies of those. Uh, they presented it to uh, the neighbors who wanted to come by the church and have a neighborhood discussion about it. So the church itself uh, is going to be expanded, I think, 12 to 13 feet on either side bringing uh, part of the, the structure and the building very close to Cherrywood. 
So it was described to me during that meeting that the ADA parking would actually be underneath somewhat of an overhang. So the building would come out and the ADA parking would be underneath this overhang, creating even more of a visual impairment for those trying to exit the property. Is Cherrywood on one of these photos? The very <laughs> bottom one uh, is from McMurray to Cherrywood. And the structure would come out over those cars that you see parked there. Uh, <laughs> my name's Anthony Lopez. I live at 5057 Cherrywood. Um, just a couple of the, um, the reasons I'm opposed to it is under zoning code uh, 17.16170, uh, the applicant shall demonstrate a parking study reviewed by the Met Metropolitan traffic engineer that the minimum number of parking spaces required by chapter 17.20 um, as uh, the applicant stated you know they don't they know they're not going to have enough parking on their off-site parking that's why they don't want to close off the road completely um, the off-site parking that they are describing is on the bottom photo if you would be to the right if the picture would go to the right is actually two houses that the church has purchased and front and now backyards have been changed into parking lots. There is no yard whatsoever. Um, also under the same zoning code under the J, uh, when not in use by the place of worship, the parking area shall be secured by a locked barrier that pro precludes vehicular access. Buses or other vehicles shall not be stored in the parking area. Uh, there's taxi cabs that get stored in the church parking lot overnight to include buses and other vehicles. Um, and my one last uh, thing is um, under 17.16.150, um, under C, the integrity of adjacent areas. A uh, special exemption use permit shall be granted provided that the board finds that the use is so designed, located and proposed to be operated that the public health, safety and welfare be protected. As she stated that uh, an individual has been hit on the roadway crossing uh, during Sunday traffic, the, the cars, the crosswalks, there is no pedestrian walkway. Um, it's essentially just turned into one giant um, commercial property to include those homes where the street is no longer a public access street. It's just a, a free for all. So that, that's our mind. Next. Uh, I am Robert Nash. I live at uh, 5018 Ashley Drive. And I serve as chairman of the McMurray Hills Neighborhood Association. We are a fledgling uh, neighborhood group that was formed in January of this year and approved uh, our bylaws and held elections in May. And we currently have 58 registered members, several of which live on Cherrywood Drive and express concerns about the proposed project. Uh, now, all of MENA's neighbors uh, value the faith, culture, and mission of the church. They want to be supportive, but, but that said, they have expressed concerns to us that you've heard about traffic safety, litter, water runoff, and maintenance of the current property. Uh, they worry that the expansion will only exacerbate these concerns. This group, uh, our uh, neighborhood association, just became aware of these concerns this past week at our December uh, monthly meeting, and therefore I would not, uh, not have a chance to fully discuss the issue in any uh, transparent way, uh, knowledgeable way. So we uh, would ask that the board, uh, if you're considering, considering passing this variance, that maybe we could defer uh, another month or so. We would like the opportunity as an association to meet with uh, the church leaders again and see if we can't work on some more of these issues and make sure we're all on the same page uh, going forward. So the other, the applicant said that they agreed to no parking on one side of the street, not both sides of the street. So what do you all think of that? From what I'm hearing from the, the members that we have that live there, they would like no parking on both sides of the street. Um, and truly, it's probably not a bad idea, not just for church services, but uh, you're probably aware they have a school there too. And so we've got a lot of pedestrian traffic, young people. Um, from a safety standpoint, probably would be better not to have parking on either side right there. So you've already had a recent public meeting. Why do you think another one's gonna make any difference? Because I'm a half 
glass, or a full half glass kind of guy. I, I think uh, oftentimes uh, a little more conversation can lead to a little more cooperation. And it's my opinion, actually, that this is being pushed through a little too quickly. A lot of the neighbors were even actually unaware of the neighborhood meeting. They were unaware of the zoning, even though the signs are out. Uh, we've taken to social media and have reached out to several of the neighbors in the area, some of whom are, are elderly and are unable to attend some of these meetings. Um, if we can have more time, I, I would kind of be in agreement to that as well, although I would certainly be opposed due to the safety issues. Um, I think it's just being poor, pushed through too quickly. Other questions for the opposition? Are you, you're objecting to the additions or the sidewalk, what are you objecting to? Uh, my main concern is the addition to the church itself. Okay. Uh, it's gonna come very close to the road, it's gonna hinder sight lines coming in and out around this very busy intersection. Um, yeah, I mean, we, and we don't have a site plan, but they're not asking for any, I don't think they're asking for variances, although in a special exception, you don't ask for a variance. Mm. Um, the variance is for the sidewalk. No, well, the variance is for the sidewalk, but special exception wouldn't, in a, in a special exception, it wouldn't say and, and we do have how this. you deviate from codes in terms of setbacks and that kind of thing. John Michael, tell us about the religious freedom laws passed federally and statewide. All right, so conceptually, there's the federal law and there's the state law. The federal law is called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, or RELUPA is the acronym that we refer to. In short, it creates a lot of protections for religious institutions to use property, whether it be residentially zoned, commercially zoned, or otherwise, in a way that befits their religious practice. And um, the short version is local governments, state governments, shall not impede upon such religious practice with its zoning laws or the development guidelines in a way, um, unless, I mean, it would have to go to some unquestionable, fairly severe, overt risk to human health, life safety, immediate clear and present danger kind of a standard in order for a local or state government agency to curtail the land use in a manner that curtailed the uh, religious practice by the practitioners in question, whether that be, again, in a residentially zoned area, commercially zoned area, industrially zoned area, or otherwise. The state law that is applicable here is called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act because of all those horrible uh, impingements on religious freedoms here in Tennessee that we've encountered for so long, I suppose. Um, the Religious Freedom Refer Restoration Act, or RIFRA, has a very similar guidelines in terms of protections for religious institutions to use property, regardless of what its zoning may be, for church use, for religious outreach, whatever the case may be. Um, the noteworthy component of RIFRA is that um, if a government takes action against a religious institution in its attempt to utilize land in a way otherwise protected by state law, uh, attorney fees apply to those cases as evidenced by the Teen Challenge case here. Our, actually, the RELUPA, RELUPA case was part of um, uh, Metro's litigious history back a number of years, 10 or 15 years ago. That so we've seen some of these were in terms of rubber meeting the road, and it is part of the board's analysis, as has been noted historically here at BZA meetings. So we have to be smart about how we apply the law under those federal and state law guidelines. The teen challenge was with the Metro Council, though, not us. That's correct. It was not an action by the BZA that led to any litigation or lots and lots and lots and lots of dollars. Um, any questions for the opposition? Okay. Anything else to add? Thank you. Let's hear from the applicant again. Please come forward. You'll have time for rebuttal. Before we get started, I have a couple questions that came up during the rebuttal period. They talked about buses, taxi cabs, and other vehicles parked on your property at night. Is that true? And That's why? not exactly true. Um, it's not exactly true? Uh, yes, because uh, one time only that uh, a bus spent the night oh, because we had a trip next day. So oh, it was one of you from a church trip. Okay, what yeah, about taxi? Church trip. Taxi uh, Taxi, I think one of the, the, the tenants of the houses ha has a, a taxi uh, service, so it could be that they're referring to that. What about securing but, the parking lot after hours with like a gate, a locked gate or something like that? We can actually, but we have service. To, we have services during the, um, the the day, the weekdays also that may, but also the the, the, the houses are rented and people are, you know have their own cars. So, uh, so I'm, I'm talking about the main religious part, not these other houses that you have. Why can't oh. you have a gate for that parking lot? 
th this is uh, the, the main parking lot has a um, more than one entrance mm -hmm. and also we have service during Wednesday morning, Friday morning, uh, Tuesday afternoon, well, Wednesday afternoon. Just overnight, and, you know, from uh, like 8 o'clock at night till 7 o'clock in the we morning. We can work on that if this is, uh, sometimes we have service 5 o'clock in the morning, it will be very okay, well, whenever, you know, inconvenient to that, you know, but, uh, we can. Did, you all didn't provide a site plan, I don't think, I mean, I mean, there's an elevation and it shows the parking lot, but it, there's nothing that shows how close it is to Cherrywood. Looking at this uh, picture here, we, we, the building is about 45 feet from the edge of the street, or the edge of the paving of, my, of uh, Cherrywood Drive. And uh, we're anticipating going out on this side only was 12 to 13 feet, which is going to put us on front of the existing car, the car that is, uh, is on the picture, which is going to just to the existing curb uh, right now. So it's not going to uh, affect that much the uh, the parking. So it'll still be at least 30 feet from Cherrywood. I would say to the face of the curb, uh, 25 to 30 feet. Okay, so we heard from your council person at the top of the hour, and she was supportive of this variance, but she said she didn't want parking on either side of the street. And matter of fact, that signs were being ordered and that put would up. be fine that, that's fine I, mm -hmm. we can we can uh, so we tell can us why you want a variance out of the sidewalk requirements uh, the sidewalk mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought that the planning department said that this is, is a, a unique problem of the uh, uh, drainage problem and okay, so here's our plan. okay yeah and you all agreed uh, in a minute ago to yes plan. Really agreed. okay also I wanted <coughs> to mention one thing about yeah. the the uh, the, uh, she mentioned uh, something about uh, accident and fatality that happened one time over 22 years of being there. Uh, one person, it was not on Sunday, it was Saturday, the street was empty, but the, the guy was driving too fast and, and she okay. was uh, not paying attention. But So uh, we know you've just recently had a public hearing. The opposition still wants to meet again. There's a new neighbors association and all that. What do you think of that? Uh, let, let me say something about that. We, I, I attended the public hearing. We had over 19 neighbor attended. So it was not like an empty meeting. We had 19 parents. We stayed the whole two hours. They mostly came on time. And we had a very good conversation. And that's why we actually did all that since the public hearing until today, not because of the meeting today. It's because of those was our concern that the neighbor had. And we had we and worked on And the council lady them. was there for the She public did hearing. attend okay. the whole meeting, yes. Uh, one more thing about that uh, the neighbor said about the parking, uh, no parking sign. Yes, it was in 2014 recommended, and uh, Council Lady David contacted contr traffic control to put uh, signs, and they refused. Uh, and they brought it up again in this uh, public here, in this uh, neighborhood meeting. And we did, as a church, uh, provide some temporary sign to put, uh, and Council Lady David contacted traffic control again to provide signage. So we don't know if they will agree this time or not, but we already put uh, some no parking sign there, uh, temporary. Other questions for the applicant? Well, is it your position that you don't want to continue our decision and meet again with, with your neighbors? We would like, we can take a decision today. We, uh, you're, I think you already recommended for approval and we uh, addressed all the concerns that were, were there. Other questions for the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? We're gonna close the public hearing discussion. Well, I've, I've been on the board long enough to have heard this uh, group come before us many times. And it, uh, there is a common theme, and the common theme is you know, that they're growing and they have needs to, uh, to grow, and they bring a plan, and, and that the neighbors uh, do come back with uh, the issues that they are coming back with today. And I, I do think it's, uh, I think it's a good thing for the neighborhood that there is a neighborhood association now that gives a, maybe a more formal outlet to uh, have a dialogue and relationship with uh, with this uh, religious organization, um, but I haven't seen anything that would uh, be compelling enough to deny the uh, special exception based on uh, the religious freedom laws that we have and the plan as proposed that you know has been a, a approved by the planning department and uh, both in terms of the sidewalk and in terms of the special exception. So. Uh, I, I do hope that if they do come back uh, with further growth that uh, 
we don't have the neighborhood opposition again, which would signal that they uh, were working hard to be, uh, you know, better neighbors. Uh, but that's, you know, that's just my hope, and I don't think it has any uh, real relation to what uh, the specific request is in terms of the addition and, and the sidewalk variance. Other board members' comments? I'm a little concerned about the addition, and we don't have a site plan that we can look at, and we're just relying on oral testimony. And that just concerns me, because it is, it is close to the road. It'll be close to both roads, and I'm, I guess during the process, they'll have to produce that to Metro, but there were safety concerns cited today, so I'm concerned about that. I don't know that we can, anything we can do about that, given the our LUPA and, and all those regulations, but. But you could still ask for records. That doesn't have, that doesn't conflict with the religious freedom they should. I, I do think it's fair enough to ask for a site plan um, if, if that is a concern based on the safety issues that the neighbors. And, and it would also give them more time to talk. So if that's one of your concerns, is it? That's my concern. I prefer to see a site plan, although okay. we do have recommendations from the planning department, but right. I know we're not a metro agency, so, but I would still prefer to see it. Um, other members, what are your opinions? Let's just say I might consider this motion for y'all's thoughts. If we were going to, I believe they've established grounds for the special exception uh, for the church, subject to the conditions of no parking signs on both sides of Cherrywood with a security guard to address traffic during church services that they would deny access to the lot from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., all subject well, five. to 5 a.m.? Yeah, let's say 4.30. 4.30. Sub all subject to planning's uh, approval as to the uh, addition size, et cetera. Would you be agreeable to considering if we did it that way? Yes. I would just say that all metro agencies all metro need to agencies. review for the safety concerns that were cited today. I don't know that it could be public works that's looking at the intersection and all that. John is not. Okay. I'm, I'm, oh, uh, what do y'all think about that? If yep. we put those specific conditions on the special <coughs> exception. And okay. I would also say that we. Okay, well then make a motion and see what happens. I would like to. Uh, put all the language I just said into a motion form. I'm happy to repeat it for the record if we need to, which is uh, place no parking signs on both sides of Cherrywood, have a security guard assist with traffic during church services. The parking lot will have a denial of access from 10 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. and the site plan would be submitted to all appropriate metro agencies for approval as conditions to the special exception as to the, that part and then separately do as to the sidewalk variance i would uh, make a motion that we agree with planning's recommendation motion has been made is there a second i'll say it motion has been made and properly seconded any discussion seeing none all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye aye, aye. Those passes unanimously. Good luck. Good luck. John Michael, let's take a break here. Board to reconvene after a short break. deferred to January 3rd, 2019. Additionally, the first short-term rental case uh, on that portion of your docket, I'm not sure what page that is, 13 maybe? Uh, that's case 2018-595, involving the property at 1414 Boscobel, has also asked to defer to January the 3rd, 2019. So again, that's case 656, January 3rd, and case 595, January 3rd. The next case to be presented to the board is case 2018-640, that involves the, case, the property at 1911 B as in Boy, 9th Avenue North in Council District Number 21. The request is for a sidewalk variance in this R6 zoning district, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial. The site plan submitted shows a proposed layout for the horizontal property regime development. 
photograph of the subject property and the view across the street, and then the view of the sidewalks in the current condition. You see the BZA notice sign there in the upper left-hand photo. The appellant is Allison Dawkins on behalf of Jesse Boyle, the owner of the property. We've got uh, appellants present and accounted for. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 640? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. We would ask the room to come to order, stop talking, make zero noise as we have to continue with the board's business. Thank you for your cooperation on that matter. Mr. Chairman, we'll have the appellant introduce himself by name and address and make the desired presentation. Uh, good evening, my name is A.D. Dawkins with Dawkins Contract and LLC, 815 Old Dickerson Pike in Goodlesville, Tennessee. I'm representing the, I'm the contractor for the owners, Jesse and Billy Boyle on that property. We're requesting a sidewalk variance and a variance on, uh, in lieu of the uh, sidewalk fund. Currently, there's about a nine-foot sidewalk there that's in excellent condition. And I'll, I'll that's excellent condition? <laughs> the, the picture is deceiving, sir. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it does not look like it's in maybe good condition, probably fair condition. I would not classify that as excellent. Okay. We do have that wall there. Then uh, we uh, were requesting by the uh, retaining wall, it's a historical factor in that community all along that street, so we were going to maintain that and repair that to the original state as best as possible. So that's what we were requesting, uh, lieu of the uh, sidewalk ordinance and, and So this is down the street from Jones Padilla on that area? Uh, I think so, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, why don't you think you should build a new sidewalk at these excellent conditions, and why shouldn't you have to pay into the fund? Well, currently there's a, a nine-foot sidewalk there that really uh, gives plenty uh, safety while, uh, safety right away uh, versus close to the street, where it's, it's almost uh, comparable to the six-foot green and the six-foot sidewalk. Okay, yep. so, so as you know, the Metro Council last year passed a sidewalk ordinance requiring all new constructions either build a new sidewalk or pay into the fund. So part two, why aren't you paying into the fund? Well, that was just a request. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's just Quest a request. On questions that. for the applicant? No? no okay. So. Anything else to add? Uh, no, I, I think the planning board had a, had approved us, but I'm not have recommended it. A approved that you could pay it to the fund. They, they, they recommended it. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> Close public hearing discussion. Well, you know, the position that I usually take on these is I do think the sidewalk's in good condition. I understand that we want to retain the wall and planning is agreeable to that but they do have recommend that recommended that he contribute in lieu of mm -hmm. we don't have a council person telling us otherwise so i'm open to other people's suggestions well you know how i feel if the council person is here that's one story but we don't have a council person here in person saying mm -hmm. somebody shouldn't pay into a fund or build a sidewalk so i'm saying we should follow the law I move that we deny the variance request for the uh, site. Perfect. Well, they they could pay into the fund. Well, approved with the conditions of the planning is that, is that, is that different? Mm. What's the, the conditions of planning just basically saying to pay into the fund? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Chairman, of important note, they also note that he is not fund eligible at this location, apparently, just in case that has any effect uh, on your okay. intended motion. Okay. Okay. okay, so I move that we approve the variance with the condition that they be eligible to pay into the fund if they do not wish to build a new sidewalk. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. <laughs> Next case, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-643, involving the property at 735 29th Avenue North, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial, as it runs right along the interstate there to the east. Alex Craw is the owner and appellant for this case, where there is a request for three setback variances, namely the side, front, and rear setbacks, which is to say all of them. The front setback is presently set at 20. The request is to reduce that to 12 foot 3 inches on this unusually shaped lot. 
The rear setback is set at 10, the request is for zero, and the side setback requirement is three, the request is to reduce that to two. The site plan submitted gives you some idea of the proposed layout. We do show on this document the request is to reduce the rear from 20 to 10, so we'll invite the appellant to clarify that as you make your presentation. The uh, photographs of the subject property submitted here gives you some idea of the proximity to the interstate and the overpass at that location. The view up and down the sidewalk of the existing location, sidewalks of course are not part of this appeal, just setbacks. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 643? Seeing none, we'll invite the appellant to introduce himself by name and address and make the intended presentation. Hi, thank you for seeing me today, board. My name is Alex Craw. My address is 604 Basswood Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37209. Um, I'm here. I first want to thank John Michael for, for clarifying that. It, it looks like there was a little bit of a miscommunication, a misunderstanding um, to some of the facts of this case. I, I am just requesting uh, the following setbacks of a 20-foot front setback. Originally, uh, the contextual setback was 27.9, so this is a reduction of 7.9. Uh, the rear setback is currently 20 feet. I'm requesting it to be 10 feet, which is a reduction of 10 feet. And the side setbacks are currently each 5 feet and 5 feet, and I'm requesting 3 foot and 3 foot. So it's a reduction of 2 feet on, so on either side. The, why do you need on the right-hand side 3 foot when your house is drawn at six or more can you say that one more time well I mean on the on the elevation plan that, that's provided it has on the left hand side a three foot proposed setback and the house is kind of on that line but then it has a three foot right hand setback but the house is probably another three foot on the other side of that it's got like six feet from what, the line well I believe it's because the the, the back property is angled it's kind of pizza pie shaped, uh, inter it, this property backs up to Interstate 40, right. and if that right hand setback were, were to be five feet, that angle would be a lot sharper and would cut into that house corner right there. Oh, I got you. Yes, sir. But you're not actually gonna build into that three foot? That's correct. That we're five foot setback. Correct. It's just, it's, it's for the angle of the back. Yes, sir. Right. It's for the angle of the back, and I've, I've purchased and owned this property for several years, and, um, was well aware that a house did exist there that was demolished in the 90s. Um, I've, I do not have a neighbor on the right side. Those smaller right two parcels, I'm told, are owned by Metro and they're unbuildable lots. Um, they're up towards the corner of Batavia Street. And I have communicated extensively with my next door neighbor to the left, uh, Ricky and Cynthia Nelson at 7727B. Uh, and they're in full support of this. We had a, a couple of issues we needed to resolve with a, a driveway that they had built on my property and they've just been very compliant and we're all on the same page. I actually met with them yet, uh, this morning to go over some trees that are on the, on the border that they both want removed and we want them removed as well. So um, they're in full support of, of this plan and it's, it's, it's for a one story house. We felt like that would, match the neighborhood and also, you know, help eliminate a little bit of noise being next to Interstate 40. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. Anything else to add? No. Thank okay, you. Thanks. We're going to close the public hearing. So this is right near 440, near um, Jefferson Street area. And as he said, the Metro owns the vacant lots, it looks like, to the north. And he's talked to the neighbor next door and he's agreed. So, any discussion? I mean, it, I mean, it definitely is putting as much house as you can on a lot, but it's a, a recently modest house. It's a, a one-story <laughs> home, and uh, so it, it doesn't appear to be uh, trying to, to completely overbuild the lot. It is definitely an unusually shaped lot. Uh, I'm very happy to know the back setback is 10 feet instead of zero. That was right. the, well, the biggest the, concern the, I had. Well, the interstate's the neighbor, so uh, and, um, I'm not sure if Governor Haslam objects or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the, uh, and, and yeah, so I, I, don't, I really don't have an issue with uh, what's being proposed. I think the hardship's there. Do you have a motion? Uh, yeah, I'll move that we will approve a 20-foot front setback and a 10-foot rear setback along with uh, three-foot side setbacks for this property because of the unusual shape 
lot and the uh, working with the neighbors and no uh, opposition. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-646, involving the property at 355 Haywood Lane. Jim Gilkey is the named appellant for the church that's filed this special exception request, again, for religious, uh, religious institutional use in residentially zoned property. The RS-40 property along Haywood Lane, shown here on the zoning map and here on the aerial map, is proposed for construction of a new temple. As required, this comes to the board for a special exception with a recommendation from planning. The site plan submitted shows a proposed layout for the church at this location. Recent site visit shows the property from Haywood in the upper left and then across the street in the lower right, view up and down Haywood Lane at this location as well. The appellants are represented by council. Mr. Holland is present on their behalf. Is there opposition present for case number 646? There is. As a result, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Then the opponents will have, of course, a shared 10 minutes to make their presentation. Uh, council, obviously, you'll want to save any portion for rebuttal out of this originally allocated 10 minutes. If the parties would just introduce themselves by name and address and make the desired presentation to the board. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Jason Holloman, 4800 Charlotte Avenue, and I'm here today on behalf of the applicant, the ISSO congregation. I would like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal at the end of this. Um, I'll be brief. Um, some of you may recall, Mr. Chairman, you probably recall the same body came before this entity two years ago, slightly over two years ago, uh, to make a request. It is uh, essentially the same request as was made before. Um, as members of this board are aware, uh, once you receive approval from this board, you have two years to act upon that permit. Um, during that time, this congregation anticipated um, that they they were in the process of purchasing the property at that time they believed that they could design and get their permits in order prior to the two years um, they did run into some design issues I will note that one of the design issues that they came across um, is that they attempted to make this building a little more or a little less Eastern in its design, I should say. Um, and those revisions took them a few months. And as a result, the two years ran out. So I, I just want to let you know, th there is nothing different or additional about this proposal. In fact, the ultimate site plan um, that you have before you here today, which I'll also say is a little more detailed than what we had before because they're further along in the process, um, does show a smaller floor plate than what was there before. Uh, they still are asking for 500 seats, which is what's relevant to you in this decision. They meet all of the parking requirements, they meet the buffering requirements, and they are in the process of stormwater approval. One thing I would like to point out is that one of the conditions of the previous special exception was that there would be no access to Raywood Lane as part of this special exception. That's the neighborhood street uh, behind Haywood Lane. And um, as you can see from this proposal, uh, that road is dead ended as was requested last time. And in fact, um, perhaps not shown specifically on the site plan, uh, but because of the, the implementation of stormwater design, there will actually be significant topography change from the parking lot to Raywood, essentially making it impossible. And Raywood's behind? Is Raywood is behind, yes. It, 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 Raywood. I could run perpendicular if it was continued out to Haywood Lane there. And you can actually see it in the upper left-hand corner of the design. Um, and just for your convenience, um, we have provided some side elevations so that you can see those as well. Um, with that, I'll just reserve the balance of my time or answer questions as there may be. Okay. Any questions for the applicant before we hear from the opposition? Uh, planning department had few conditions to their approval? Have you read that? I, I, yeah, I believe sidewalks is the main one, and they are willing to construct sidewalks as part of this. Um, mm -hmm. We have we had a community meeting on Monday night. Mm -hmm. uh, we shared with the neighbors. There, there are no other sidewalks along this area, mm -hmm. um, and we really left that to the purview of the neighborhood. If the neighborhood would strongly support not having the sidewalks because it is just going to be you know, sidewalk along the frontage of this property only, we may consider coming back for that request, but only if that's something that they support. Otherwise, we'll simply construct them. There was um, 
Provide one canopy tree for every 15 parking spaces for the zoning code. I guess you're going to do that. Anyway. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if our um, the order from the last hearing is in our packet. I was looking for that. But um, do you have that? And was there anything else that we... I, was there any I, other condition? I don't have that. My recollection was that the only substantive condition was the Raywood Lane connection. And, and that's what we heard a lot, again, from the neighbors. So, so thank you. Okay. Let's have the opposition please come forward. All those who are here in opposition, it's your time to speak. You will have um, 10 minutes collectively to speak maximum. So divide your time up. State your name, address, and why you're here in opposition. Good afternoon. My name is Amelia Workman. I'm president of the Haywood Lane Neighborhood Association. And um, we are here first. I wanted to bring up the point that um, even though we're back here on the second round of this particular uh, congregation's desire to build, um, the timing of the notices to the neighborhood um, were not good. Um, and this council is the same council that was here two years ago, yet he didn't contact uh, the neighborhood groups. Uh, we had the public meeting four days ago in the evening, and, and I know you've seen this letter because I asked for a deferral, and I didn't hear a deferral at the beginning. Um, and honestly, I mean, we couldn't contact people. I'm not within 600 feet and only found out about this. Um, approximately two weeks ago. Uh, we would prefer to have a deferral so that we could have a neighborhood meeting to come together and talk about this. We are not disputing this church, this congregation building on this piece of property. The issue we have is the size of the temple. Um, and Chris Wilson, attorney that I work with, is gonna help me with showing you some blow-ups that I made that you have copies of. And I want, it to, I want you to specifically look. Here is the temple property, which is the 27,000 square foot temple. And I want you to look at the different square footages of the buildings, including a church here that you approved two to three years ago, and how much larger this temple is compared to the rest of the properties in this residential area. Um, across the street is the Latter-day Saints. This church is 14,000 square feet bigger on a smaller piece of property. Um, and the other two churches, 6,000 square feet larger, Christ Lutheran, and then the new Agape Mission, which I know you guys can't really deal with this, but they showed you a picture and then they built something that was not what <laughs> we agreed with. And I'm not sure, I guess we take them to court. We haven't done that. And then we have the other two Hindu temples, which are also smaller in square footage and on larger pieces of property. So this is a very tight residential area. It sits at the top of a hill. Um, this time around, they have shown us some architectural drawings, but we have yet to see a picture of the entire building. And this can be an, a dramatic effect on our neighborhood. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about traffic, because I did two years ago when I was here. But we do, according to TDOT, have 22,000 cars a day traveling Haywood Lane. This is at the crest of the hill. We believe there should be a certified traffic study done and we, as a neighborhood, may even be willing to join in the cost of that to determine whether there's going to be issues here that need to be mitigated because of the location of their exit onto Haywood. Uh, Haywood is, has no turn lane, it has no shoulders, uh, there's no stop signs, it's a cut through between I-24 
and uh, Nonsville Pike. So um, this church is 27,000 square feet on 5.78 acres. And we're just asking that they decrease the size of that. We would like to see 20,000 square feet. Uh, we would also like to see a better rendition of what they intend to build. Um, we have had issues in the past, in the last two years, about noise complaints with uh, uh, activities they've had there, and I realize they're going to build a building, so hopefully those will go away. Um, they seem like nice people. Um, we would like to have more of an opportunity to talk with them about what they're going to build because it will be something that's going to change our neighborhood in a dramatic way. Do you have any questions? Questions of the applicant? Do you recall any conditions we put on the approval last time? Uh, for the Raywood Lane, um, where they could not cut through um, from Raywood over to Haywood. However, that has been happening. And, and I know they tried to block it, but, you know, it didn't really work. But that is their responsibility to do that. <laughs> Uh, we would like to see some conditions put as far as the size. We'd like to see a bigger landscape buffer because it's so close. And, and as you can see, I mean, and plus this is a special land use policy, which I know is a planning thing that we went through years ago because we wanted to, to maintain that. But I understand how special exceptions work because we do have churches. Um, but... The addition of this one will be seven tenths of a mile. We're going to have one, two, three, four, five, five churches. <laughs> I mean, uh, we we don't we aren't opposed to churches. We're just thinking that you know the amount of traffic that it generates. They plan to grow. Uh, they have a 500 seat. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're just we're asking for some consideration, and uh, instead of. Our religious institutions have, a, it seems like, a Superman power to come in, you know, and, and we want to be good neighbors, but we feel like that this is too large uh, for this particular acreage, and we're asking for consideration in reduction of that. And I don't know if you can put that in your order or not. Um, and I'm not sure how you enforce your orders because So, I mean, I know. guess the, the question is, on in terms of size, is is you know and and you heard the uh, religious freedom act and our loop act um, kind of overview a little bit ago with another case that we had and you know is there a compelling government interest that uh where the size here uh, does have an immediate and detrimental impact on public safety it could but we don't know because we haven't had a certified traffic engineer tell us that. Now, my husband and I did a traffic thing two years ago, you know, and and there's a fire hall right down at the end, and, and we know because we live in this community the issues that we have and the, and the ways we struggle. But um, whether that's a compelling uh, thing, I don't really know. I mean, we, you know, we, uh, we struggle as in many parts of Nashville. With, with traffic, so I'm I'm there and I understand that, um, but you know if there's a, I understand that law and I know how difficult it makes it for you guys. I mean, and so I'm I'm there on that, but I want to defend our neighborhood. <laughs> you know, I've lived there 50 years and and we want to be good neighbors, but we feel like that sometimes we we aren't hurt as far as you know the effect. Uh, that comes into our neighborhoods. Any other questions for the applicant? The landscape. I mean, uh, yeah, one more. The landscape buffer you mentioned. Are you? Are you They're looking? doing the minimum. We we would like to see a little bit more because since it's so close to the residence, but. So you're talking about the side, um, the property lines yes. on the side, not fronting the road. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you for being here. We're going to hear from the applicant. Oh, oh yes. Please speak. My name is Jeff Sexton. I live at 5003 Crosby Lane. I'm the director of the Fairlane Park Neighborhood Association. Um, and respectfully would ask that you really take into consideration uh, deferring this and giving us some time. It's been two years, over two years. What's, what's 
what's a couple more months to sit down and go over this? Um, not everything has been discussed. There has been many issues uh, during this two years. The police have been called uh, because of gatherings. Uh, there is an ongoing uh, police, uh, they, they look at the cut through off of Haywood Lane through their property to uh, Raywood now. They have done nothing at all to stop that. Um, this was their responsibility. They said they would be transparent and talk to the community. In two, over two plus years, we've had no communication. Um, the size of the building being, being scaled down and we had in the meeting, they discussed how they wanted to build for the future. Uh, there are options for them to find a, a more suitable location that would give them the excess they need, the size for growth. My concern, they're gonna be back down here within just a few uh, years with the same problem of asking for more variants to grow. 22,000 cars daily on Haywood Lane with no shoulder, a fire truck. You're looking at community safety at a, at a huge risk. Uh, the neighborhood has been more than welcoming to churches, having three already before the Burmese tr church was just allowed in the past year. Uh, what we're gonna do is, is we're going to put our entire community at risk from safety and fire and medical uh, because of the traffic excess. I would, I would encourage you, if you could, to come out and see that traffic, uh, if you have that opportunity, uh, and see exactly what it's like for a fire truck to try to get out. I talked to the district fire chief, where they have to wait anywhere from two to three minutes on a call. That could be the difference of a defibrillator getting to someone for a heart attack or a house burning down. So we are looking directly at community safety with the fifth church going in. It would not matter to me if it was a police station. It's not the right place, it doesn't make sense, and it will continue to put this community at risk. And so you, you, you both had mentioned gatherings now. What, what kind of gatherings happen? Is there a building there now or is it? There are two houses there which uh, will be demolished once they build their, their building. They've just rented large tents. And, um, and there's a great green expanse. All those south side lots have at least three and a half acres of land. And uh, so that was what the guy, and so the, some neighbors were calling because the music went on for a long time and it was loud. So. And, I, mean, and I think I remember this, this, in this the strip of land that has restrictions on what you can it do does. for the view. And I, knew, I remember from the last time that uh. it, because the religious organization is is uh, one that, uh, and again, not, it's not specific to this one, it's really specific to all of them, is that mm -hmm. you really don't have, there's not a lot of uh, leeway that we have to impose some of those conditions right. uh, that, that folks are talking about. But I remember the discussion last time about the, the efforts that went into to try to protect the views and, the, and that yeah, part of the we Haywood do, Lane. We try to do that, plus, separate and apart from there, there's private restrictions on all of these lots. And, and of course, that doesn't apply to the church, but it does apply if anyone else tried to, to build homes. Um, we just, um, we would like another opportunity to, because it's my understanding when you lose your special exception, you have to start all over again. Is that correct? They didn't build within That's their exactly two year period, so they had to come by, back and do this right. all over again, yeah. So. Having the public meeting four days before here and after the noon deadline so that, you know, we didn't have time to file anything different. And, and I went to the meeting Monday night, but I mean, there was only a few of us there. I mean, we have connections in the neighborhood and we could have gotten this meeting in the neighborhood, but council did not contact us. And so it makes our, our, our people suspicious, right? I mean, you know, we've got this church over here that said, yes, we're gonna build this, and then they built that. And, and not to say they're, they're not understanding, but we would like an opportunity to work with this temple to see if we can come to some compromise of some degree, to, whether it be, you know. So according to the applicant, this is basically the same building that they did two years ago. So what would two months or a month, you know, kind of, you've, you've seen what they proposed in the past, you've had an opinion on it, what would a month or two do with 
of this discussion? Well, I think that if you are living like we live in a community, don't you want the people to be good and be comfortable with these people? I mean, and many of them have not met them. What do you mean by these people? By the congregation that's coming in. Well, why wouldn't, I mean, there's a lot of people that live out in your street. Why wouldn't they be comfortable with this congregation? They're not uncomfortable with it. Please don't misunderstand what I just said. It's just that they, we have new people who have moved into the neighborhood. They don't know anything about this. It would be very instructive if, since they're gonna be part of our community, that they actually come together with the community that's going to be surrounding them. Well, they had a public meeting. That was your chance to get together and see That was four were. days ago, Mr. Ewing. I know, but. That I was mean, not timely. So when, would it, when should it have been? You they know. filed for this October the 10th. You granted it October mm -hmm. the 30th. So whether they didn't it was send four days ago or not, you said there are very few people showed up. So these people. We didn't have enough time. We had a week. They mailed the letter the day before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. People didn't receive it in time. So, Mr. Chairman of note, it's absolutely true that the date of the notice letter with regard to the neighborhood meeting organized by the appellants is dated November 21, which I think is exactly right. That was the day before Thanksgiving. Of equally important note, the notices of the BZA case were mailed by my staff on November the 12th of 2018, 30 days ago from today's date, meaning that all the people who own property within 600 feet of this property received notice that the case was coming up. We filled in multiple inquiries during and, that time. And they so got notice of this meeting I wouldn't want today. there to be a misunderstanding among the board yeah. that somehow nobody knew the case existed okay. until And they got the notice from your letters of this meeting today and that they could email or mail any Right, just differentiating between opposition. the board hearing notice versus the neighborhood Neighborhood meeting okay. notice. Gotcha. If I may, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, I think that we, we we're not addressing a time overall now. What we're addressing is if it's been two years, what's two months? Also, too, I think direct to the point is with the with the current uh, religious act in place. I personally, as 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 many do, and I think with uh, Metro. Uh, fire and medical would, would agree if they could be involved. There is a direct safety issue to the community. There is a, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very direct uh, safety issue to the community. There is no center lane. There's no future plans for a center lane. There's no shoulder. You have no way for a medical ambulance to get through there at either morning, afternoon, or emergency traffic. You have, we have already seen that fire and medical cannot get out. We had over 2,000 the last time we was in front of this board that was verified by Metro Police uh, calls for in one year on Haywood Lane, 2,000 calls for service. Okay. This is a, this is a direct to risk to the community. Okay, that's time. Does anyone have any other questions before we hear again from the applicant? Okay, thank you for being here. Thank you. Applicant, this is rebuttal time. You get to respond to what you've heard. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And I'll start off by asking they want to more time to talk. Respond to that. Uh, as, as the chairman, I believe, is aware, there was extensive community conversation about this exact proposal two years ago. I believe that this congregation had at least two large group meetings and I think several more informal conversations. Okay, let's talk about what's happened recently though. Um, we have met the requirements of this board, um, obviously to, to commit to the public notice that we're all required to do, but in addition, we organized uh, another meeting uh, to show the elevations, to show the facade work that had been done, and all of that was organized as, as quickly as possible. I, I will say I got involved after the application was filed a second time, and I scheduled a meeting as soon as I could, as you can imagine, with Thanksgiving holidays and trying to find a location. Um, it, it took a few days, but we had that meeting as quickly as we could. How do you respond to their traffic and safety concerns? Well, with regard to traffic, I understand the, the average counts on Haywood Lane, but understand this congregation actually meets on Saturday afternoon, which is the lowest time for traffic on Haywood Lane. So compared to just about any other use for this property, um, the congregation's impact is, is going to be at the lowest flow traffic time, and there's not really a volume concern 
down on Haywood Lane on a Saturday about afternoon. emergency vehicles and all the things? That Obviously, all of those things have to be addressed by Public Works as they as they pull permits and finish developing their site plan. And um, they've worked closely and met all of those requirements. If I could address also the, the questions about landscape buffer and uh, also the question about the size of this facility compared to some other facilities. Um, as I'm sure this board is aware, um, there are specific guidelines set up by the Metro Council in place for several years that describe the scope of of land required for various sizes of congregations. This is a request for a maximum of 500 seats in this building. Under that context, they would be required to have about two and a half acres of land in order to seek a special exception of that size. And as you can see from, from the opponent's own site plan, uh, they have 5.78 acres on this site. So they actually have twice as much, more than twice as much land as would be required Required under the standards set forth by the Metro Council uh, for a church of the size that they're proposing. Uh, with regard to landscape buffers, landscape buffers are specifically identified and set out as a class B land or class B landscape buffer at, for a church of this type, and um, that's what's drawn into the site plan and what's planned to be installed. Questions for the applicant? Can you explain the condition with? Raywood again? They sure, and I did go look back at the order. I found it, and and that was the only condition that was added. Um, it, it, the condition is simply that 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 connection be dead ended as part of this development, and they're still committed to that and happy to add that to this as well. And as you can see from the site plan, not only do they intend to dead end Raywood and not have vehicular access out of their parking lot because of the stormwater features that they're going to implement uh, in the rear of the lot, it would actually be topographically impossible to get a, a regular vehicle from their parking lot to Raywood Drive. So that, that will physically end once the construction is started. Now my understanding is during this interim time, um, the old condition has continued to exist. There was a vehicular connection and for a period of time people not necessarily congregants continue to use that as a cut through. Uh, and then my clients actually placed a physical barrier there to prevent it from continuing. Um, there was also a mention, I think, of uh, events on the site. I want to be clear, as part of their religious experience, they dedicated this property. They had an event which they had a permit for a tent and went through all the proper metro procedures to obtain that. Uh, to essentially bless this property for the construction of this facility. And they also had a New Year's facility or a New Year's event related to their religious activities. Any other questions for the app? I do. Have you done anything with obtaining a traffic study? I assume not. But I we have. We haven't been requested. Like I said, um, I mean, I understand general concerns about traffic, but honestly, because of the, the hours of use of this property, it's not anticipated to have an impact on, on traffic when, when congested traffic exists on Haywood Lane. Um, they'll be at about the most off-peak time. Um, and, and if there are any, uh, if they were discussing sightline visibility, obviously that's something that Public Works will, uh, as they make their connection to Haywood Lane, will require them to meet the, the metro standards for that. And certainly Saturday, is, well I shouldn't say this, but is Saturday the only day it will be in operation? Do you have other events or days? Or I, that you need? I'll, let, I'll let him discuss Actually, that. Actually, uh, my name is Gunsham Patel. Uh, I reside at uh, 144 Hospital Street, Katy's, Kentucky. Uh, we would have, that is the main uh, congregation, then uh, then there would be a, in purges as far as if you reside within that area, they would go do their prayers and uh, do their, uh, uh, you know, form of praying. Uh, they could do it in between seven in the morning to uh, 12, and then uh, from 12 to 4, uh, we have uh, basically resting hour for the God, uh, as uh, from 4 to uh, 8 or 7.30, depends on the uh, weather. Uh, usually the temple stays open to public, 
and uh, people would come in and do their prayings and on an individual uh, basis. On the individual basis. Um, how many days a week is that? Uh, actually, it uh, temple is open seven days a week. That same time frame. Uh, What's your expected volume on days other than Saturday? Saturday and Sunday, because usually Sunday would be it would be that would be more like evening hours, because mostly uh, congregation, uh, whoever attend the congregation, they're business uh, oriented people, and they usually work Monday through Saturday, and have a little bit of time or a break on Sunday, so they could dedicate it to the God. Any other questions for the applicant? I just have a question for council about his opinion on what this does seem to be a massive facility uh, compared to what the community is dealing with. I mean, what size is sufficient to not curtail the religious activity? I mean, is, is the applicant saying you've got to be this big in order to promote their religious activity? The, the way that the Metro Code is set up, and I'll try to answer your question, I think this is, the way the Metro Code is set up, it deals uh, not with, you know, how much sort of entryway and that kind of space it is, but how much seating it is. And as I said before, this is, you know, twice as big a piece of property as required for that amount of seating. Um, so there, there will be additional facility there, but I think that's just the architectural style of their house of worship is to have that additional, you know, sort of grand entry space. I, I will point out that part of what they did that, that caused them to have their permit lapse is try to um, bring down some of the height of the building. Most of this building is only going to be 24, um, 24 feet high. There, there are some parapets that are taller than that, but for the most part, this building is frankly no taller than your average two-story house. Okay, anything else? Okay, we'll um, close public hearing discussion. So let's take up the um, the issue of people wanted to defer. Do we, board members, you feel comfortable that this is the time to hear this? You've heard enough information today. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think I could make a decision. What are people's thoughts about this? I'm always concerned with the the safety issues, as I'm sure everyone else is, but I don't know what to do about the fact that Haywood Lane is a two-lane road with no turn lane and no shoulder, and um, how do the emergency vehicles get through if there is traffic? I don't, it seems like something Metro has to deal with, not necessarily well, the temple. Well, I mean, I, I think we, maybe we should ask our new legal counsel uh, Mr. Poole, what he thinks about, I mean, how, or do you have any advice on how we should think about, like, you know, Arlupa and the Religious Freedom Acts and as it relates to traffic and this type of thing? I mean, is it is it compelling enough? Is it not, uh, you know, at what point does it trigger us saying, wait a minute, we really do need to go rethink this from a safety perspective? Well, I think what I viewed is, if, if that's a concern, then I think, you, you, you would have to have some type of actual traffic study. Um, I believe the way the law is written is you, you, you can't base your decisions off of um, <coughs> doubts or, or general fears that, that traffic is gonna be a problem. I think you would have to set up in a way that you have a study that ex at examining the time where the church is, or the facility is gonna be used most often and seeing what or how that relates to um, the problems that might come, come from the additional traffic. And is that burden on the applicant or is it on the opposition in a religious case? A, a traffic study to prove it's unsafe. The government has to demonstrate the compelling government the interest government for sure. You, I'm sorry. I was looking at the law on this. The uh, compelling governmental interest to find other than approval is just that, the government's responsibility to demonstrate that. So we would need to see something to justify not granting the special exception vis-a-vis -vis the federal and state protections for religious land use. Okay. 
in that context. The, the and of note also, Public Works reviews precisely these questions with regard to the municipal uniform traffic controls guidelines, with regard to the chief traffic engineer having an eye on these issues. In no way do we say that to uh, diminish the neighborhood concern over, for Pete's sake, we've got a narrow little two-lane road. I've walked that road trying to do site visits out there in the past for some of these cases, and I will absolutely confirm firsthand, it's narrow, it's not easy to get around out there. But at the end of the day, Ms. Carpenter said it correctly, it's the city's responsibility, primarily through its public works agency, to make amendments to the road conditions, the road widths, the road frontages, the curtailage, or anything else that's associated with that at that location. And um, I know this uh, very two very active neighborhood associations, I do not doubt, have worked with their council members through the years and with their uh, state representatives to try to make the changes needed. That said, it's not a zoning issue ultimately, and so not technically part of, I mean, certainly something to give consideration to, but ultimately not something that the board has to resolve. So if we grant the special exception request, they will have to go through the normal permitting process and that's where that is when they will run into public works. That's correct. It, to the same extent that the building would have to be inspected by building inspectors and trades inspectors and a fire marshal's inspector, similarly, the site plan would have to be reviewed and approved by all the reviewing agencies, including but not limited to Metro Public Works and the engineers who work with them. And, and I guess the, the size of the building is not, so, I mean, I know that the, the, the neighbors, I, I mean, I guess what I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of concerns from the neighborhood that you know, I, I'm, I might have if I were a neighbor. I understand it I, and I empathize with it, but it also, they seem to be things that uh, are really outside of our our purview. I mean, if the, if the, if the, I mean, it's a special exception and we're looking at that, but I guess I'm not sure how uh, on a religious uh, institution uh, we could bring compelling safety interests in, in terms of size other than it, as it relates to traffic. The important note there, Mr. Taylor, and you're on probably the right line of analysis, is that size of a structure is regulated by the Metro Zoning Code at 17.12, along with other aspects of the bulk regulations. So the size of the structure, the height of the structure, the setbacks, all those things are already being governed. They have not, they, the appellants, have not sought variances from those bulk regulations, which means they intend to meet or even exceed the minimums that are set forth. And that in was a testimony of their council, too, is that they were going to exceed the That's how square I understood footage it. or the uh, acreage required for that size. That's right. And, and council said it correctly that both the site size and even the parking counts are pinned to the number of seats in a sanctuary. Uh, however, size of the structure doesn't necessarily follow the same path. It's just governed by the bulk regs, which in this case, I think I looked at the um, the bulk regs table for this for non-residential use and residentially zoned property of this size, uh, the bulk regs hold that the floor area ratio is 0.4. That's a whole lot of building in a three plus acre lot. Right. Well, and, and, and Hindu temples don't have the same type of congregation or sanctuary type uh, area that, that other religious organizations do, and but they also don't have this, the type of uh, you know, mass gatherings. I mean, there's some events like that, but it's it, it, it's more as it was described in okay. terms so of private. What are your thoughts, board? Does anyone have a motion? That they've met the requirements for a special exception and that we grant the request. Motion's have been made. Is there a second? Uh, and I would say subject to the restrictions that we placed in our prior order. Okay. That no access to Raven. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Ravenwood, is it? Motion's been made. Is there a second? second? Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case of the board's consideration is 2018-650 involving the property at 6353B Columbia Avenue in Council District Number 20. Ricky Scott is the appellant on behalf of the ownership group for the property shown here on the zoning map. The aerial photograph here shows a uh, prior condition of the property and this is what we're going to show as our site plan. The request is for a variance from lot size requirements, and this is the R8 zoning district. Eight, of course, means 8,000 square foot minimum lot size. The request is for approval of the 7710 lot size, again, 7,710 square feet, such that the R8 zone district would allow for construction of a second residence on the property. Will the people that are leaving please quietly exit? 
The appellant's present. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 650? Please raise your hand so that I can see you. Seeing no opponents, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourself by name and address first. Sure. Um, Ricky Scott, 4705 Alabama Avenue. Um, and I'm uh, here, we, just to give a little background and a little more, um, frame this a little more, we purchased a single family lot um, that was originally parceled as two when the original subdivision some time ago was put together. Um, we're advised to quit, quit claim deed it back to the original. So you can see there that the house spans over two separate lots. Um, and when we quit, quit claim deed it, deeded it back, um, that's when we found that one was smaller and the one adjacent was larger. So together these two lots still represent um, an, a s more 1,600 and I think, I'm sorry, 16,242 square feet. So well over, um, together, well over the $8,000, 8,000 square foot requirement. Um, we, uh, when we found that out, went to um, Mary Carolyn, um, our uh, local councilwoman, and um, had her complete support. Her recommendation was that we try and figure out a way to do it, um, to, get, to get it taken care of administratively. Uh, planning was in support of us maybe relocating the lot line, um, changing the angle, um, and or re relocating it because we had plenty of road frontage for the um, for the zoning requirements in the neighborhood. I think 50 is the requirement. We have 60 on each of those two lots. Um, what we found, um, which brought us here, was that um, uh, in doing and replatting in the in trying to move that line, we would run into some ordinance where I don't know the particular number. I apologize, but uh, where in replatting you lose duplex eligibility. Um, after 1984 or something like that. Um, so we're here with um, her support and um, obviously we're one of the neighbors, but our adjacent neighbors, um, the Hatchers, uh, we have their full support as well um, in having met with them and, uh, and, and spent time with both of, the, of them. Um, so that's, that's our case. Any questions for the applicant? As he noted, we do have an email from Mary Carolyn Roberts, the council lady from that area, and we have one letter of opposition from someone also as well. Do you know the, do you know the neighbor in opposition? I do not. That's the first I've heard of any opposition. It's a Miss Janice Foster. I just didn't know if you know where she may. I have, I'm sorry. I have no, no She's idea. Six, six, She's. I mean, 633 Columbia Avenue. So she, we're uh, 6353, so, I'm sorry, you said 6333 three, 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 Columbia. Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where she would be. And I think her, okay. op her opposition was, yeah, she against the duplexes. Duplex. 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 The duplexes were not, yeah. out of, they were out of line for the character of an easement. Well, as you can see, the seven lots on this one city block have three of the seven already have duplexes. I have one other of the seven that is um, by right zoned for duplex. Well, they're all zoned for duplex. Um, so I think it is well within the character of the entire neighborhood of Charlotte Park. It's the actually maybe 50-50 at this point. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, nope. I'm gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. Well, I mean, this is one of those cases where, you know, the, the angle of the, the lot, well, it's, it's a couple things. One is it's an old house that was on two lots, but they're, you know, legitimate building lots. and. That's what people are doing. They're just they're, uh, and, th and that's how the code's written. And so, the one lot that's narrow is, uh, I think it's, it is because of the shape of the street. And I think it's, you know, those those, to me, those lots that are within five percent, um, ish of the of the minimum, but have that diagonal as an end. I think were are the odd shaped lots that might. Uh, warrant a variant, so I, I, don't, I think this okay. is close enough. That, Do you have a motion? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll will move that that based on the um, the the shape of the lot and the the angle of the uh, rear property line, uh, which causes the lot to be slightly less than eight thousand required. That 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 is a, a lot shape hardship that uh, would warrant a variance. Uh, in this case, which I uh, move to approve. Okay, motion has been made. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Motion has been made and properly seconded. And, and I will note that the applicant did work with the council member who is in support of this and got immediate neighbor support. Okay. 
Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. John Michael. Appreciate you. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-657. This is a case that involves a property at 1714 12th Avenue North. Again, case 657. There we go, shown here on the zoning map, an RS, residential single family, RS5 zoned property on 12th Avenue North, shown here on the aerial photograph. Uh, Robert Rogers is the appellant and owner of the property. The request before the board is for a variance from the multiple conditions associated with the detached garage in the RS5 zoning district, more specifically a reta an attached or detached residence. As you know, residential single family means exactly one residential unit under the base zoning code. However, the zoning code in 17.16.250, I think it's part A, talks about accessory dwelling structures. In this case, you would not be allowed to have a detached accessory dwelling unit, again, because of the attached, um, without meeting a number of very specific criteria, but because it is, in fact, RS zoning. Um, however, the notion of what we call colloquially the mother-in-law suite is potentially allowable if you meet all these conditions outlined, conditions one through eight, under 1716.250. The one that seems to be in play here for Mr. Rogers and his appeal is the requirement number two, there's a free and clear access between the housekeeping units without going outdoors. Stated another way, the mother-in-law suite needs to be part of the main house, connected to in some way, without having to go outdoors to get to it. Naturally, an exterior or detached accessory dwelling doesn't meet that criteria, thus the request for the variance. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 657? Okay, that's a pretty concise overview of what the case is in terms of staff's analysis, the basis for the denial at the staff level, thus setting up the appeal for the Rogers to come in today. If you would, please just introduce yourselves by name and address, and you'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Uh, yes, my name is Robert Rogers. I live on uh, 1714 12th Avenue North. And what this is a little bit of a hardship situation. Uh, my mother is coming to move in with me because of her ailments, uh, knee surgeries, and et cetera. Unfortunately, the space above the garage is uh, uh, an area that is uh, two floors up, so my mother is moving into the space of the house, and I'm kind of giving her a little bit of her own independence, and I'm going to be moving, uh, if I'm able to, to move into the space above the garage while accommodating my mother's needs. Okay. And, and this would, if you had, if, if it were attached, I mean, if you had a, some kind of connection to the house at all, then, then we wouldn't be here, is that? Um, and then, so this isn't, um, so you, you, this is your, you're, you're planning to live here. Um, we don't want, uh, John, we don't have the issues of like subdivision, you know, the, you know, the day due to try to sell them both. I mean, you can't do that. There's no H. One of the other conditions is common ownership of the structure or of the uh, residences. Of course, normally these are attached, so it's very obvious that you can't divide ownership of the interior mother-in-law suite right. kind of concept. But yeah, they would have to meet all the other conditions, but it wouldn't be in play here, like you said, Mr. Taylor. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Um, if they were to sell the property, this doesn't transfer to the new owner, correct? The approval would run with the land, but all the same conditions would, such as this has to be an actual, specifically identified family member. That's a requirement under 1716-250A, just the same. The same uh, separation requirements, the single meter, uh, common ownership, all of those criteria would have to apply in just the same way. But I believe that the, um, I believe that the variance approval would travel with the land. So are you saying that if we approve this variance, it naturally it comes with a requirement of, for a family member? Yes, let me read that exact section of law for you. 1716-250A is in Adam unit, or item number six reads, the second unit must be occupied by a family member defined as grandmother, grandfather, mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter, mother-in-law, father-in-law, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, aunt or uncle. Sorry, cousins. <laughs> Uh, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, well, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. Um, grant the variance uh, as to the condition for the detached garage based on the uh, hardship that was discussed. And the testimony of that. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, looks like the next case for the board's consideration is 2018-665. This involves a property at 721 Groves Park Road in Council District Number 6. I believe you have uh, correspondence from the district council member with regard to this project. Stephanie Shipp is the appellant. Daniel and Stephanie Shipp's owners that subject property. The request for two variances. First, from sidewalk requirements at the property shown there on the zoning map here on the aerial, and from setback requirements in the R6 zoning district. This also happens to be in a contextual overlay district, the um, zoning bugaboo for much of East Nashville. In proposed construction for a single family residence, the site plan submitted gives some uh, indication of the uh, intended layout of the residential structure. The recent site visit shows the subject property, the view across the street, than the views at this corner lot. You already have recommendations in your case file from the planning department with regard to their recommendations specifically on the sidewalk variance. You've heard from the district council member with regard to the setback variance request as well as his thoughts on the sidewalk. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 665? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Please just introduce yourselves by name and address. I'm Stephanie Shipp. Uh, live. Oh. oh. Hello? Oh, okay. Stephanie Ship, uh, I live at 721 Groves Park Road. Um, we are requesting a variance from the rear setback um, and also the sidewalk. We're uh, requesting a sidewalk variance as well. We did receive the recommendation from planning, which we um, requested to go ahead and be heard here. We were going to be here anyway for the um, for the setback, and I guess. Our issue with the sidewalk is that we're on a corner lot, so we're already, um, you know, the recommendation was that we pay the in lieu of fee for the Tillman Lane side only. Um, we're building this house because it's our cheapest option in Nashville right now. Our current house is literally falling apart on the inside. Um, and so what we're, uh, because there's been so much new construction in our neighborhood, we're kind of concerned about constructing a sidewalk um, and that there it won't go anywhere because all these new houses have been built without these sidewalks and so you know where where will ours go will it just end that's kind of where we we stand on that as far as the setback is concerned our lot is shaped a little bit different um, and we are we we have a platted neighborhood as well which um, requires 30 foot setbacks for on both streets which kind of pushes us into this little back corner um, the the our plan right now only goes back into that rear 20 foot setback by um, around six feet and it's not even consistent all the way because our house will kind of be diagonal against that rear setback <laughs> or the rear property line so that that's kind of where we stand right now Okay, any questions of the applicant? No? So I haven't located what the um, setback, what, what setback are you requesting? I know it's the... Rear. It's the rear setback. Um, it should be 20 feet from the back of our lot. Um, I don't know, are you confused on which one is the back? Sorry. No, no, um, what are you requesting instead requesting of 20 feet? We're requesting that we, um, that we actually go into that, I don't know. We're requesting that we go into that setback just a little bit by six feet. Our house will be built within that setback that sh where we should be set back 20 feet. So a portion of that requesting a 14 foot setback instead of Correct. a 20 feet. Correct. Okay. Uh, we do have, uh, our neighbors no, behind please us. Please state your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry, Daniel Ship, 721 Groves Park Road. Okay. Uh, our neighbors behind us are for it as well. Yep. Um, we have a letter from your council. Yeah, our councilman, our neighborhood council. And we do also have a, our neighbor from across the street who's opposed to the sidewalk as well. He's here today. Here with us. Oh, okay, very good. Um, any other questions? Okay. Close public hearing discussion. Well, I. I, I don't really have an issue with the, the, the setback and the neighborhood association uh, actually said they unanimously supported uh, the, approving the setback and approving the sidewalk variance without paying. The council member has said that he per, prefer uh, the, I guess the planning pay, on, uh, pay only on one side, which Tillman I think is the shortest. But you know, this is a case where, you know, you've got this engineering 
drainage ditch challenge where if they actually, you know, if we say you have, you know, we're assuming that it's uh, probably cheaper to pay into the fund than build the sidewalk because of the logistics, but if they actually do chose uh, to build the sidewalk, it probably is a less safe uh, solution for the neighborhood, and, and that's, I think, one of the dilemmas that this sidewalk bill creates in neighborhoods like this. So, so do you have a motion? Well, uh, I mean, my motion would probably be to pass the variance and to, you know, waive the fee, but I, I don't know that that's what the will well, what about is the on that one. So planning recommendation. Yeah, the planning is the, is the, the side on Tillman. So, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll let somebody else weigh in and, and okay. do that because that's... I know, I know Others, that. what do we think? I agree with Councilman Withers on this one that he, they ought to get the choice <coughs> to build on Tillman or pay into the fund. I'm, I'm not opposed to the variance request as to the setback. Well, then, do you want to make a, do you want to make a motion? I make a motion that we... Uh, Allow grant the variance to allow uh, the owner to decide whether to build the sidewalk or pay into the fund as on Tillman, and then we grant the variance from 20 feet to 14 feet on the rear set setback based upon the size of the lot. And that they get the variance on the, the street without paying. Yeah, the sidewalk. Yes, there. and they get uh, the variance is granted as the other side to no okay. build, no pay. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, after a couple of other deferred cases, it looks like our next case to be heard is 2018-681. Let me scroll up to that one. Tony McKay is the appellant on behalf of William Armstead Pillow at yeah, all well, owners of the subject property at 1027 31st Avenue I North. The, the request is an item A appeal, which we'll address just shortly, involving the zoning administrator's determination. Big time. Dinner. Mr. Mr. Chairman, apologies, I have skipped over one case. Somehow in our 54 case docket, I made a mistake in the sequencing. All apologies. If we can go back to 2018-680. Oh, you're right. Oh. I have a trial run. I have it. Someone, was that the 6 inch one? I don't know. It might have been on consent. It might have right. been. No, but there was one that was. Yeah, yeah. my confusion, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. All apologies. 680 was previously recommended for consent agenda, but was pulled off earlier in the day. Case 680 involves a variance request from the front setback requirements in the RS5 zoning district. Okay, so who's, who's here for 680? Prism Properties is the eight, appellant, Steve eight, Shrive, eight, the owner zero, of that property. For the property on Sharp Avenue, in Council District Number Five. Again, the as I understand, the um, setback requirement here is 30 feet five inches. The request opposition? is for 20. Okay, we'll wait till the opposition time. Okay. The aerial map here, the site plan submitted gives an indication of the proposed development of the subject property with that reduced setback. The uh, recent site visit shows these photographs of the subject property. Because there's opposition present, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Please just introduce yourself by name and address. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew Walters with Catalyst Design Group, 5016 Centennial Boulevard. Uh, here representing uh, with me uh, is Steve uh, Scheib from Prison Properties. Um, We'll be brief. Uh, this was on consent, as mentioned. Uh, just two clarifications on the description. Uh, this is actually an RM20 zone property. It says RS5 uh, in the uh, in the language there, but it is zoned RM20, and we are actually looking to do attached, um, what would be considered uh, attached townhomes, which would really classify as multifamily. So that's another just minor clarification. Um, as mentioned, this was on consent, so yeah. we're happy to defer the rest of our and time. And we also have Councilman Scott Davis. Oh, yes. This is his district. You've been sitting here for hours. I know you want to weigh in on your neighbor here. Well, why don't you tell us what the hardships are? You don't want to come forward? Okay. Well, while we're waiting yeah, on the council. Tell us sure. about the hardship. Yeah. Sure, and it, it's all in the packet. It is a you uniquely shaped it. property. Uh, a good portion of the property is... Uh, encumbered by the stream setback, uh, and so uh, we are we are limited to how much density we can put partly by that. 
Um, but but it, what we're doing is falls under the existing RM20 zoning, so there's no rezoning effort or anything needed for that. This is just on the front setback. Okay. And you're requesting 20 photos, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Councilman Davis. Oh, everyone's done? Okay. Um, so anything we, else to hear no, from? No, uh, there's the right time to just respond. We, we, we've been trying to contact okay. them or talk in the okay. back, but they want to speak, so we'll let okay. them. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. let's hear from the opposition. Please come forward, state your name, address, why you're here to oppose it. Hi, my name is Adam Grover. Oh, please press the button there. Hi, my name is Adam Grover. I live at 870 Sharp Avenue, which is the lot on the other side of the, uh, pretty much right next door to where this development is planned. Um, it just seems like that this was, uh, it's kind of the variance was set as being a single family residence, but it clearly looks like that this variance is an attempt to kind of just add in a bunch of extra units um, onto this lot that is already kind of small, if you will. Um, at the end of this block, there's really not a lot of traffic, and I think that, you know, adding all these other townhomes at the end of the lot is going to cause a lot of other traffic and kind of offset the whole, you know, architecture of the neighborhood um, as everything else is single family residence and this is gonna add five townhomes um, towards the end of the street. So, yeah. Um, I am the lot literally next door so on the same side of the street. The picture? Yeah, um, on, the, on the same side of the street or the cross the street? Same side of the street, that little square to the right of that. So you're the pink. immediate next door neighbor? Yes. Okay. Right there. Okay. Any questions for the opposition? And your house is 30 feet from the street, and they're wanting to build. Now, they're going to have a driveway, I guess, between you and the next house, but it looks like they're going to build 20 feet from the street, so they would be 10 feet closer to you. Now, we're not here to talk about whether they can build six or not, because they, the, it, we're just here to say how close could this, that all they're asking for us to do is is give them permission to be closer to the street than, yeah, than the 30 required. So I mean, I, we can't say, hey, you can only build four or whatever. I mean, we can sure, say that's you said. have to be 30 feet or you, have, you can be 20. Okay. So, any other questions of the opposition? Okay. Nope. Thank you. Let's hear from the applicant again. Did you have anything else to say? Um, no. Yeah. Okay, this is rebuttal. Respond to what he said. Okay, um, sure. And one thing I will mention, which I didn't mention before, it's in the packet, but there's a substantial amount of improvements that we'll be making uh, just to extend the road, which you can see there. We also have to extend a, a new culvert. <laughs> Uh, so there's some there's some metro improvements that are involved in addition to a water line extension because it's existing extended to the parcel is simply a, a one inch service line so we're going to upsize that to a six inch main. Um, so there's there's a significant investment of public improvements uh, to kind of complete this block. Um, we felt like that was a fair trade off I suppose for our for our small request. What kind uh, of landscaping do will you have or will you have any landscaping on the Line. There are required buffers, uh, which are shown there on the site plan. Um, um, and I'm, I have to grab my notes if you don't mind just to look. Yeah, I don't see anything that's listed as a buffer on the site plan. I see right of way. I see, we're, well, there's a required. Yeah, there's a required stormwater buffer on, on the channel itself. And what it, it says drainage feature, is that something that's already there? It's, it's a wet weather conveyance. It's not, it's not defined as a stream, but we are, we are looking at doing a buffer on that just based on Metro's maps for uh, drainage basin size. But, I mean, is that drainage feature already that's on the site plan? Yes, is sir. It already there? Or yes, is sir. It, yes. That's an existing condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's already a ditch. And so, so it's a five foot buffer on the other side of the ditch is what you're proposing. Is there going to be any fencing? There's a there's a five foot buffer from the top of the bank that we're keeping. I'm not I sure mean, if I follow your question. Or... I mean, we're not we, we don't intend to do any improvements from that buffer point to the east. And the east is Just toward your neighbor. Towards the neighbor, correct. 
And so is there any fencing? Are you going to put up a, a fence or? Uh, we haven't gotten to the point of detailing that. It wouldn't surprise me if there is a small decorative fence of some kind, but it would it would probably not be anything that's. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think yeah. that I mean, that where well, the neighbor spoke to, to density and 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 we have, I guess, some. We have our, our decision has some impact on the density in the sense that, you know, we if, if we push it further, it may or may not make it possible for you to to make it as dense, but it, it may sure. or may not. I mean, that's not that's, that's a, I mean, that's not our decision. Uh, you, you could squeeze six units in there if that's what RM20 allows you right. um, without and, the setback. But it seems like that there should, you know. Yeah, and and, and I should uh, speak to this too. That the the. the <coughs> The setback really helps us actually achieve a, a more marketable footprint. If we feel like for this neighborhood, we could do the six units with a slightly smaller, you know, encroachment. Uh, if we had to go to the 30 foot, it just it, we we feel like that would actually be a little bit more out of character with the neighborhood, uh, just from the size of the units. Uh, and so, you well, know, yeah, that, or you know, or as as I was, you know, just again thinking, and it's not up to us necessarily to solve all the issues between you and the neighbor, but it seems like a lot of times when you have issues like this, you know, applicants agree to put up a, you know, sure, right. six or eight foot fence down the property line so that it, yeah. it's a privacy fence that, um, that kind of helps, helps, you know, the single family homes, uh, deal a little bit better maybe with the multifamily lots, but I don't know if that's anything anybody else is on anybody else's mind or. Right. I mean, I think we're certainly open to that dialogue. That's actually partly what we were wanting to try to attempt to do and, and, and save us a little bit of time this afternoon. But, uh, you know, at this point, we haven't been successful in being able to have that dialogue. So anything else to ask? Applicant? That means you tried to have a conversation. Yes, sir. Or didn't okay. have one? Okay. Anything else to ask applicant? Okay, nope. Let's hear from Councilman Scott Davis and uh, maybe you could shed some more light on this. Thank you. Um, um, Commissioner Taylor, I think you're reading my mind over there. Um, you know, because by right, they do have the, the natural zoning there to build their units. You know, of course, I want them to build a better looking. You know, they can put six on there as it stands and, doesn't, and don't have to talk to anybody. You know, but this will be a better design. Uh, originally, I got calls and some emails from some neighbors because at first they were confused because they thought it was RS5 lot, but it was not an RS5 lot. After that, not too many. And what I would ask, you know, that you require, you know, a fence, you know, so that, you know, like you said before, many times in these neighborhoods, you know, when we have this, you know, and uh, they have a fence so that the, um, so that the neighbor can have some sense of privacy you know, so that, you know, not everybody is, gets what they want, but at least, you know, there's a sense of privacy because as he said before, he has his zoning. And if he, if he builds regular, you know, without this variance, it's, he'll build them, but they're just gonna be ugly, just to be frank with you. Cause I've seen people do this before right. and you know, it's, 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 what's, it's what's going to happen. But what I would like though, is for um, the applicant to be required to protect the neighbor, to, be, to put up a privacy fence, you know, along the border or however codes <coughs> specify, it's, you know, where it needs to go. But I'm, besides that, I'm in support and of, of the development, you know, once most of the neighbors saw that it was not an RS5 lot, you know, and saw the stormwater and all the stuff that Metro is requiring for them to put in repairs, you know. So would you be uh, agreeable to build a fence? Yes, that would be fine. We can we can we can okay. build that along that frontage of that buffer. Probably okay. makes the most sense. Any other questions for the councilman? Okay, nope. Let's close the public hearing. Discussion. Eight once you're out of the front setback.
Okay. Well, well yeah, I mean, the, it, I, th I think that the, the density is not, I mean, this, it's RM6 has the right to build those. Um, because it's on the dead end by the railroad track, uh, you have one neighbor that's there. I, I'm, I mean, I'm willing to uh, entertain a, a setback, although I do think that a requirement would have to be, you know, an eight foot opaque fence, uh, wooden fence. Uh, Running from where? The, the length of the property line uh, from, uh, I would say 15 feet setback at least uh, back. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's really the, the length of the property unless, I mean, I think you can do it 10 feet back, but are you What do you all think about that? You? I like what you're all doing, but I didn't see the hardship. So, um, but make a motion and we'll start. Motion. Well, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I, th I do think it is a, a, it is a strange shape lot. And I guess the question is on strange shaped lots where you're, you know, he's not asking for a variance in terms of how many you can allow on a RM20. But just go um, ahead and make the motion related to the fence. Yeah, so though that's a, I mean, that is, it's, it's just an odd shaped lot. Um, so I would say based on the, the odd shape of the lot, uh, I'll move that, that we approve the, the 20 foot uh, setback variance with the condition that the, uh, Applicant uh, construct a wooden fence, eight foot tall. Um, you said opaque. Yeah, opaque. But I do think you know, I do think that's wooden and not a, a, okay. a chain link that has the stuff yep. in it. Okay. okay. And uh, and that that f fence uh, be at least uh, fifteen, you know, with it fifteen feet from the road or from the setback. Uh, so that it's it, it's five foot in front of the line of his uh, buildings that he's building. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Ooh, three to two. What happens when it's three to two, John, Michael? The board can entertain another motion if they wish. If they do not wish, then the case stays open on the board's docket, uh, on the board's uh, We will entertain next another docket, motion. December the 20th. Well, let me ask this. If we don't grant the variance, he said he can build without the variance. So if we don't grant, grant the variance, he then gets to build and the neighbor doesn't get a fence. Am I, well, is that right? Well, that's, that is true, but then he also gets uh, set back at the line of his home, which is what he may prefer so that Okay. Yeah. Any Thanks other motions so. or should we move on to the next case? Let's let the others have some fun and decide. Okay. Our uh, other missing board members. Yeah, I mean, okay. and I, and I, it'll stay I open. Even... It'll stay open. John Michael, tell us what happens now. If there's no further action taken by the board, then this case stays on the board's docket. It'll be heard again on December the 20th. And any board members who are not present today have the opportunity to review this case, uh, then participate in the vote on December the 20th. There will need not, need not be another public hearing on the subject unless for some reason the board uh, sure. chooses to reopen it. But the bo vote okay. will take place on the 20th. Okay, next case. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-681, involving the property at 1027 31st Avenue North. Sorry for the false start earlier, folks. Uh, Tony McKay is the appellant on behalf of William Armstead Pillow III and others, owners of the property at this location. The request before the board is an item A appeal. It's a challenge to the zoning administrator and zoning staff's determination that this is not a legally non-conforming triplex property in this and RS5 zoning district. As is always the case with traditional item A cases, staff presents a uh, basic overview of what their determination was and gives the appellant the opportunity to make their case presentation. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 681? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes at the appropriate time. Here's the overview, Mr. Chairman. The request is basically to get to an end result that allows a triplex use at this address. Um, 
I do not doubt that there is a triplex use present. However, the analysis that we have to go through, legally speaking, at the zoning level is, is it a legally non-conforming triplex? As you see with an RS5 zoning district, the zoning restricts this to one residential use. However, that's only been in place since 2006. From 1974 forward, that was an R zoning district, allowing one or two families. So. What we do in every instance, including this one, is review any documentation that we can, always made available by the appellants or, or uh, building permit applicants, as the case may be, say, bring us NES records, bring us other utility records, bring us rental records, bring us anything you can that shows, number one, that there was, in fact, a triplex use. Uh, very helpfully, the appellants submitted photographs that seem to demonstrate three distinct kitchens, three distinct living areas, uh, and any other documentation you can. Our staff at the zoning examiner level reviewed the NES records that were submitted, but those NES records did not demonstrate conclusive continuity of triplex use from pre-1974 forward, 74 being noteworthy because it was zoned for two family use in 74, not three. And apparently from our research, the house was constructed in 1974. So we're always looking for something that would get them to the three. We found nothing to that effect in terms of the research that's been done both by the appellants and by us. We may be able to get them to two as a legally non-conforming use if, in fact, the documents tell that story in terms of a continuation of, of duplex use, at least, of a legally, not illegally, but legally non-conforming nature from pre-2006 to present day. But again, more documentation might tell that story. But our review showed no documentation supporting a legally non-conforming triplex use. Uh, we, and this is of no fault, I need to be clear here, no fault of these folks. A lot of times people buy properties and say, hey, it's a triplex use, that's a great business opportunity, or inherit that, or whatever the case may be. But it doesn't mean it was a legally non-conforming triplex. So, so I'll field a couple of questions before continuing. So until 1974, they could build three. We don't know that for sure because no, I don't no, have I mean, the zoning records from pre Okay, so we don't know what it was, but, but we know at least in, two, in 74, from 74 to 2006, it could, they could build two. Correct. And in 2006, they could only build one, and that's the current zoning. That's the current zoning, correct. And then, um, and so your records show the house was built in 74 at the time. That's the best information we have, yes. Okay. One other note that's pertinent here, there were permits applied for and obtained in 94 and 95 in some sort of renovation of the subject property, indicating the construction of the accessory structure uh, somewhat seen here on the aerial, seen more clearly here with the polygon on the zoning map to the rear of the subject property along the alley. The application for the building permit and the subsequent application for the trades permit, I believe it was the electrical, both stated in the permit scope code not to be used for residential use or commercial use. So if any of the three residential units contemplated here are in that uh, rear accessory structure, they stand in violation of the permits that were issued 23 years ago during the construction that led to the creation of that building. Further evidence demonstrating not only that we don't have enough to show that there is a legal triplex use, but overtly showing that there is something other than permission to have triplex use. Best case scenario, there's some rental record, there's some something that shows that since 1974, this has at least been, or rather since pre-2006, there's at least been consistent duplex use at this property not including any do, any residential uses in that accessory structure. That would demonstrate legally non-conforming duplex use and save two residential uses in this uh, single family zoning district. Short of that, uh, you can see how the zoning staff got to the denial and why we helped them file their item A and bring the question before this board today. That's our overview. Naturally, I'm happy to answer any questions, whether now or later in the hearing, but absent that at the moment, we'll hand it over to the appellant so they can introduce themselves by name and address. Uh, Tony McKay, 627 Creve Road. And Sean McKenna, 604 Claiborne Court. Uh, so this, uh, the building was constructed as a, a triplex, I think by the lady that lived in the front, and it was maintained as a triplex throughout. Um, according to the family, she got tired of having renters in the back sometime in the mid-2000s and uh, didn't, didn't release the property back out, and then NES eventually came in and took the meters off. Um, it, it, like he said, it does have three distinct, it has both, all units have a front and back door. They have, uh, all have kitchens and the accessory dwelling, I believe is a, a rear detached garage. Wait, that, so when did she get tired of, you said she got tired in the 2000s of renting it? When did she just stop renting it? How long? She did stopped, it? she lived in the front and 
According to her family, she had enough money that she didn't want to deal with tenants anymore, so she stopped leasing it out. Uh, and how long did, did she, and she didn't lease it out anymore? Do y'all bought it or? She did not. She uh, she passed away, and her heirs are the ones that that own it that uh, that gave us this information. But I think they uh, they had records up until 2006 on one of the units. Um, yeah, and we. Um, there's quite a bit of parking sp spots there. Um, there's spots in the front. It's a total of five different spots throughout the lot. Um, just to add that in there, uh, there's three separate, very distinct separate meters, which of course they pulled two of them off, but um, that is intact. Um, just to add as well, we went around and talked to all the neighbors, um, or as many as were home. Not everybody went, was there. Um, but we got signatures. Everybody was in support. The people right next door said he acknowledged the fact so that he acknowledged the fact what? That it had always been a triplex and that he, he's, his wife's family owned the property next door and he inherited that. And he said that as long as he knew it had always been operated. How long did he live there? Uh, I'm not sure his total time there. I know the family has had it for over 20 years, I would believe. The person you talked to? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, so, but the testimony, though, is that it, it went for several years. In fact, the mid 2000s until, I mean, it sounds like it went for over 10 years without <coughs> being rented as a multifamily unit. And so to me, I'm not sure, I mean, if that not, I mean, I think 30 months is the most you can have vacant a non-conforming unit before it goes back. It, Mr. Taylor, you hit it right on the head under the provisions of 17.40.650 subsection C, legally non-conforming uses, any interruption of the legally non-conforming use for a period of 30 months or more, and this is specific to residential uses, but it's the same under state law for commercial uses, interruption of two and a half years or 30 months or more vacates the legally non-conforming use. Uh, to use the more colloquial phrasing, your grandfathering rights expire. Right. And we, we understood that in, in speaking with Richard Thermopolis, he, he was the one that uh, gave us the idea that he felt like uh, it was a good idea to move forward, even knowing that um, after looking at all the pictures and uh, it's, you know, obvious from all the photos that the house has only ever been a triplex and it would even be strange to try to make it into something else. Like it has front, back doors everywhere. Everything has its own HVAC unit. And I, I mean, it, it just, it would be odd. And he, he also said that, um, I don't think that would pertain to this right now, but he felt like a higher density in that area across from the park was was uh, a great idea. And there are multiple other uh, non-conforming triplexes on that street there, like within like There's three two, or four doors. Yeah, the and, guy next door, it's a, it's a single family, but it has a residence above a garage. And then the next one down is a triplex and there's a vacant lot and another triplex. I, I, mean, that, I mean, to me, it, it seems like it makes sense. It, it seems that it, to me, it look you know, it looks like it was built that way. It's set up that way, but it also, I mean, what you're asking for with us is, yes, to say that the zoning administrator erred, and it sounds like even by your testimony today that he didn't err. I mean, that that it was vacant for more than 30 months, and therefore it's not, you know, a legal triplex. And it sounds like, I mean, there may be other paths to get a triplex there. I mean, can, would you have to rezone it SP or something and go through the council? Multifamily SP, certain mixed use districts might allow it, but it would be a rezoning because this zoning absolutely does not allow triplex use. Yeah, and I mean, and, and that may make perfect sense for this, the property. I mean, it, based on what you said, it, I, I, I'd get it. But I guess what, what I'm looking for you know, on an item A, which basically you all are coming in and saying the zoning administrator made a mistake, I mean, that, that's, the, that, that's our criteria for I, just the way you all, you know, applied for this uh, appeal, and you may may not have known that. You know, <laughs> yeah, people, definitely not. You yeah. know, a lot of people don't. Yeah. Um, but an, an item A appeal basically says, hey, the zoning administrator said we can't do it, um, but you come to us and, and tell us why the zoning administrator was wrong, and sometimes they are, and sometimes there's a reason, but, but since you all have, since the family has said and you've confirmed that it went that long without being, um, it rented, then I don't. I don't think we have a remedy for you. So, do you have any other information that? So we I guess the future of this building is just is what I mean. I know that's so unrelated to other residents. Talk, like talk, talk to, talk wondering to from the standpoint of you just. I mean, it talk to. I mean, you leave you're, two you're vacant you're units on the back of it for perpetually. <coughs> no, they're okay on two. 
No. We would have to review the NES records again, but if there has been a discontinuation of two of the units still and only one has been maintained, then it's only eligible for single family What's as the, single the zoning okay. district dictates. Uh, unless they rezone the property, um, unless they rezone the property, use variances are not allowed under the zoning code. Yeah, so I mean, it would take the legislative body, the Metro Council, to kind of change the zoning. They 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 do zoning. So, anything else to add? It's not. Okay. Yeah, no. but talk to talk to John and Emily later, either tomorrow. Or, okay. Yeah, and they can tell you what path could possibly get you to what you need to do. But I don't. But it's not us. I'm okay. Sorry. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Well, I mean, I think by the testimony of what we just said was that um, the testimony supported the fact that the zoning administrator was correct and therefore uh, you make a motion. I'll move that the uh, zoning administrator did not err uh, in the determination based on the evidence presented uh, and without uh, existing or anything new, any new evidence, uh, which pr presumably be done at the staff level, that this uh, appeals denied. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented is 2018-686. Purser Architecture is the appellant on behalf of the owner of the property at 1413 Riverside Drive, shown here in HPR development in East Nashville, Council District Number 7. The request is for a variance from the rear setback requirements in this R10 zoning district, shown here on the aerial map shown here on their site plan, the proposed layout for the development. The rear setback set here is 20. The request is for a reduction of three uh, for the construction of a 900 square foot detached accessory building shown to the rear of the lot, the far right of this screen. Subject property shown here on the face and across the street as well, up and down Riverside in this slide. Uh, the appellant's present. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 686? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourselves by name and address. Uh, Dave Purser with Purser Architecture and Design. Uh, address is 2819 Columbine Place, Nashville, Tennessee, 37204. My name is Paul Andrews. I'm at 1413A Riverside Drive. Okay. Why are we here? Um, so my client desires to build an accessory structure uh, in the rear of his yard for use as a uh, home recording studio. The... Um, hardship here is that there's a wet weather conveyance in the backyard that severely restricts the building area. And so we're asking for a reduction in the rear setback, a reduction of 17 feet from the required 20 feet. So okay. a setback of three is what we're requesting in order to um, construct a facility <coughs> that is at least, or that's 900 square feet, um, which would make the project feasible. And so is it a one-story? Uh, correct. Any questions so, for the applicant? So, is it a recording? Is this a a business, or what? I mean, what is? <laughs> it's it's uh, private. We're in Music City. And so, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I, I see the, what is that, sewer easement or whatever that it's, is? It's, that a, it's a wet weather conveyance, uh, is my understanding. Is there a, a neighbor behind you? No. No, no there's not. It, it, I, from that uh, eastern property line, there's yeah. actually an alley behind the property. Uh, it's, as my understanding, it, uh, it was determined to be unimproved, and uh, it's, I think, overgrown. It goes back okay, so we, several blocks. We, we got okay, a, so you have a you have an, an unimproved alley, which gives you basically another 10, 15 feet. Correct. There's no them. neighboring property to the rear. So your neighbors are they for it? They are. Okay. So that means your council person's for it. Yes. I, I think we have on record that the uh, councilman has said that if the neighbors are for it, he's for it. Yes, if not, exactly. there's been a letter in support from the right. okay. next door neighbor. I'm, if there are others that you know of. Okay. With. Yeah. Any other questions for the applicant? And then, and I guess it's an HPR or something. You have, there's two on the property, and so you have that kind of in correct that line behind you. That's why you can't turn it the other way because it would go into the neighbor's property. Yes. Okay. Let's close the public hearing discussion. <coughs> have a motion. Uh, I'm 
make a motion that we grant the variance request based upon the requested side of the size of the property and the uh, ditch that runs through the backyard and the councilman approves and the neighbors approve. Okay. And motion. the unimproved alley behind it, which oh, less, yes. has less Thank encroachment you. of the neighbor. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. John Michael. The next case for the board's review is case 2018-688. David Haverkamp is the appellant, Daniel Watterson, the owner of the property at 1704 Blair Boulevard in Council District Number 18. The request is for two variances, one from the minimum lot size requirements in the RM20 zoning district shown here, and the property shown here on the aerial map. Second, uh, variance from sidewalk requirements for the construction of uh, residential units on a parcel with an existing single family unit already in place. The site plan shown here shows a proposed layout for the existing house and then the proposed structure with two units. Yeah, hey, the face John, yeah. quick, I'm just going to recuse myself because my partner's the architect. Very well. As Mr. Taylor recuses himself, we'll still have four members ready to, uh, to hear the case. The recent site visit photographs here show the subject property in the upper left-hand corner, the view across the street in the lower right, and then the view up and down the street with the existing sidewalk conditions shown here. Uh, again, noteworthy here that this is a request for a lot size variance in the RM20 zoning district. In the past couple of meetings, we've seen some of these, whereas we've never seen them in the past. The RM20, the 20 part, of course, indicates 20 residential units per acre. It's rare that we see a lot small enough that that's not really the analysis in terms of lot size or how many units go in, but instead the minimum lot size, which is 7,500 square feet. Here with that 7,500 requirement, uh, they're shy by having 7,137. So what's that, a reduction of uh, 363, I believe, in terms of the um, variance sought. The sidewalk requirement is addressed by the planning department in their written recommendation to you, members of the Board of Zoning Appeal. So you have both of those pieces of information in front of you. Uh, are there op opponents present for case 688? There are none. So the appellant will have uh, five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Please just introduce yourself by name and address and take it up with the board members. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Haverkamp. Um, I live at 700 12th Avenue South um, here in Nashville. Um, and so um, I'll be taking you through uh, my request today. There's two parts. Um, the sidewalk request, as you saw from planning, um, the existing sidewalk there is in really good condition. Uh, it's part of the historic neighborhood. It's only off by about a foot, from my understanding, of the, the new guidelines in width, and it has the proper um, um, green strip. Uh, from the curb to the sidewalk. Um, so their recommendation was to keep that so that it matches the rest of the sidewalk going through the street as long as it's maintained and the ADA compliance uh, is, is met. Um, so I, I did say that I would agree to those terms um, and I think that makes sense so that the sidewalk continues to match the neighborhood. Um, on the um, request for the zoning variance, so we've been doing planning on, on the property there and trying to figure out the best uses for um, the existing structure, which is historically protected under Metro Historic um, guidelines, and also um, the, the new construction at the back of the lot there. Um, we came across the, the square foot limitation on the minimum so so lot size for the, um, the property there, and that's where this request came from. Um, if you look at the, um, the satellite images there, you can see um, the house itself is surrounded by multiplexes on both sides, uh, which in the current iteration, if you look at the back of each of those lots, including um, 1704, the entire backyard is, is either paved or graveled on each of these and just uses parking lots, which, um, you know, uh, I guess addresses the parking for, for the multiplexes there and the Sterling Court apartments uh, back the back of the lot. So that's a three-story plus a full basement um, 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 older apartment complex that, that meets the back line lot line there. Um, so um, what we're requesting there is to, to be able to put uh, an additional structure um, towards the back of the lot. The, the hardships there are the angle of the back lot line are what caused the square footage to drop just below the minimum um, as it goes to the, the apartment complex there. Um, and then also there's a sewer line easement. If you see, it's kind of hard to see under those three cars there. There's a 15 foot wide sewer easement that runs kind of the opposite of the diagonal of the back of the lot, um, which, which kind of limits and, and, and 
we have to get creative on, on where we place the structure, basically. Um, so those are kind of the hardships on the, on the, um, on the placement of the, the new structure. Questions? Okay. Questions for the applicant? What are the hardships on the existing structure, the sewer line? Um, so there's a sewer line easement at the back. If you look at this current, um, um, that's up on the screen, that, that's a 15 foot wide water and sewer easement um, right. that was just placed in fairly recently, actually, um, for, I guess, a, a modernization of the sewers is my understanding. And then also um, kind of the hardship on the lot size itself is um, it, it's kind of an oddly angled back lot line. And I, I'm guessing because of the apartments that were built back there, there's a bunch of green space there that kind of goes between the apartments and, and, and my lot there. Um, and if that lot line was straight, I think we'd be just over the 7,500 square feet based on our calculations. Okay, so the 15, <clears throat> the 15 foot easement on this diagram is the sewer easement? Yes, sir, okay. the one that you can see right under those three cars. And we did, I mean, obviously, you know, understanding that all of the planning that we do for this new build and, and anything we would change on the existing house, which, which would be fairly minor other than updating um, and, and repairing there, um, all has to go through Metro Historic, right, and, and be approved by them. So the footprint there of the new structure could change dramatically based on what they will approve and, and, and as we work closely with them um, to, to get that developed and, and kind of scoped out. Um, I've worked on several historic homes um, in Belmont Hillsboro, East Nashville, et cetera, um, and so uh, I understand that that process is kind of a, uh, it's a back and forth, right? So this wouldn't be the final site plan. This is just to give an idea of kind of where parking could go and how that would fit within the easement. Board members, you have a letter, a paper letter from uh, Robin Ziegler, the Historic Zoning Administrator in opposition to this. Um, she word, says, word. it's kind of at the bottom of the pile that you came in today, this with this letterhead. And um, they say, staff of the Historic Zoning Commission recommends disapproval of the request for the three units at 1704 uh, Blair Boulevard, which is located in the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The property is zoned RM20, but the lot does not meet the square footage requirements for all three of these units. And it says, although we typically do not comment on use or density related to requests, we have done so for when the quest can result in a design that would not meet the district's design guidelines. So they're saying that given the size of this and the conservation overlay, there was nothing that they think could be built to look like their guidelines. So that's just for your consideration. And I'd like to politely disagree if I could. Um, I did I did just also receive that letter this morning, so unfortunately I didn't have a lot of time to prepare for that or talk with Historic further. Um, I did have a verbal conversation with them initially uh, with Sean Alexander, not with Robin. Um, but so I did speak with Robin briefly before this meeting. And, um, you know, my opinion would be that, that I, her fear is that they would get stuck with basically a zoning requirement that would make them approve something <laughs> that they wouldn't want to approve. And, and my take on that is they, they have the final say on what the exterior design sc uh, scale, scope, um, heights, you know, setbacks, um, materials are used, all of that. So um, um, I feel like putting three units within um, the footprint here, as long as they agree to all of the exterior look and feel, um, it shouldn't really matter to historic whether there's two units inside of that space or three, as long as we're, we're fitting within the, the fabric of the neighborhood from, from an exterior standpoint. Uh, and I spoke with uh, Michael Ward, the architect who has helped with the initial planning here, and, and he's, he uh, agreed with that. He said the plan would be to make this either addition to the back of the house or separate structure, depending on what historic will allow, basically. Uh, it would not look like three separate um, units from the exterior. It would look like two. Okay. Other questions of the applicant? Oh, and I also did speak with Berkeley Allen, the councilwoman for this district, um, about this uh, several times. And her main concern was regarding uh, affordable housing within the neighborhood. That's one of her biggest concerns for her specific district. Um, and, and to me, being able to do the three units would inherently cause more affordable um, housing because the units would be smaller and priced more affordably than if we have to do one larger second unit, which we can do within the existing um, zoning guidelines. And I did speak with um, CJ Hicks of the Neighborhood Association um, for Belmont Hillsboro, and she also supported that once I explained to her the, the plans. Questions of the applicant? Okay. <clears throat> I see your proposed structure is two units. Uh, it's one single structure with right. two units. With two um, units. But again, it, Historic is going to make the final decision there on whether that can be a standalone structure or it has to be an addition off the back of the existing house. 
uh, but it would not be um, more than two structures. You know, the existing house is one, and then the new structure could be a separate structure or an addition to the existing. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Um, anything else to add? That's all. Okay. Got. We're going to close the public hearing. So discussion. Um, yeah, this is a little different because we have this letter from Historic, but we have um, a letter in support, some couple in opposition. So, uh, Ross, this is your district. Here you go. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I'm concerned that Historic is concerned about it. That that concerns me uh, more than a little bit. Okay. And, um, is his uh, council person Allen giving you a letter, or she put? Is she? Is she? Is she? Is she just told you? I'm no, she. Or is she you know, the initial here? couple of conversations, she was on the fence, and so then you know, she told me that her primary concern every time we spoke was affordable housing, and so you know, as we talked about it, I said the existing zoning allows me to add a unit. So two units for sure are allowed within the RM20 on an under 7,500 square foot lot. Um, but it would just become, you know, probably the same square footage of an addition or a new structure with one larger second unit in place that would cost more. Or, you know, if we do this and, 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 and get the variance to allow for the two units back there, it would be two smaller units of a total square footage that would be very similar because that's what Metro Historic will allow. Basically, in talking to Robin and Sean and, and, and the group over there, you know, additions and, and, and such to an existing historic structure, they don't like the new footprint to be any larger than the existing footprint. So the existing house is about 2,600 total square feet. Um, we wouldn't go that large, but, but you basically, in general, that's what they look at first from a size and, and, and scale standpoint. Um, and so, you know, we would either have one larger secondary unit that's, say, 2,000 plus square feet, or two smaller units that are, say, 1,000 square feet each. Um, and, and that would create more affordable units, which is what uh, Berkeley was on board with, if, if that was the, the option. And CJ also, which is the Neighborhood uh, Association president, um, that was her biggest concern also. And then also parking for her. So she wanted to see the, um, the layout here with the, the site plan with the parking spaces off street. So. Uh, and again, to reiterate, you know, Metro Historic has all final say on all of the exterior, and, you know, s uh, scale and scope. I can't, it's not like I can go get a building permit if they don't get Yeah, so the okay. process is after we weigh in on this, and if we give some sort of approval, they still have to go to Historic Zoning to weigh in. And you've heard, read their strongly worded letter, so, you know, they get to kind of weigh in and decide how this building looks. And they get final say. I don't get a building permit if they don't sign off on it, basically. So it's not just that they can recommend, you know, unless I... They can't stop you from building anymore. You they, if he doesn't permit. get the building no, permit... They, they won't give me a building permit without Historic's yeah. sign yeah. off. Yeah. So, so they will stop me from any new building. I can re renovate the existing house, but I can't add anything structure-wise new or uh, separate or attached without So even Historic's if we approval. approve this, um, they get to kind of have the final say. Exactly. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing discussion. Sorry. So does that change anything? Like I said, they still, he's, he's got to go make an argument to them about the, you know, look of this building and even the size of this building, and then they were... Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought that what Historic was limited to doing was that their purview the, was to If it's based on the existing house. So if the existing house is a certain size, they could say the outbuilding has to be smaller in a certain size and a footprint, too. Well, I'm, I'm just concerned that if, if they really did have the final say, why would they find it necessary to give us a letter opposing it here? Ah, oh, because they, 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 they want, this is rare. They, they usually don't weigh in, as the letter said. But, you know, they obviously have concerns about it. So, but they get to raise their concerns at their meeting too, but um, we want to discuss what their concerns are, but we get to kind of decide based on our rules and our procedures. May I ask the applicant a question? Sure, of course. Given that you have to have a unanimous approval today because there are only four members left, 
uh, and given uh, my colleagues' concerns about, and you haven't had a lot of time to talk with Ms. Ziegler at, mm -hmm. at uh, Historical, I wonder if you would think about deferring your case to maybe have further discussion with her. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to. I suggested that to, to Robin, and she's basically told me that, that her opinion won't change about this. I can't, like, uh, present a, a, a projected design even, because I, I said, what if I were to have, you know, we didn't have the architect draw up um, elevations or anything yet because we didn't want to put the cart in front of the horse. We wanted to see mm -hmm. if the zoning approval would happen, and then if so, design that way, and if not, design a different way. Um, maybe that was the wrong uh, take, but that's the, the path we went down. Um, and But I asked her, I said, what if we, you know, delayed this, and if we did some, some, some more you know, further design to show what it could look like on the lot. And, and she said they won't uh, make a comment on potential designs because they're not approved by the zoning yet. So uh, I feel I'm kind of in a spot mm -hmm. where I can't go one way or the other. So we ha I chose to just come and so present. If he does have a vote today and doesn't get four votes, then another board member can review it by the next meeting. So I guess that's right. his other option. How, how does that work? I'm sorry. So you need four votes. Mm -hmm. So one member has recused themselves. Right. So we have six remaining people. So there are two people that are not here today. Okay. They can watch this on the Metro National okay. Network, mm -hmm. and then the next meeting in two weeks, they can vote on this meeting. They okay. will be eligible to vote. So that would be the procedure if you don't get four votes today. Case stays open. They get to review it, and then they can vote the next meeting if they choose to review it. Okay. Okay? So should we vote? Okay, anyone have a motion? Well, I'm going to make a motion that uh, based upon the shape of the lot and the sewer easement, we should grant the request for variance. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Well, can I ask about the sidewalk variance? I think we have two variances. Oh, okay. oh the sidewalk, too. Do you want to do two separate motions? Yeah, let's just do. Well, he Yes, but uh, he was agreeable to following planning's recommendation as to the sidewalk. So, do you want to make that part of your motion? That I'll just make follow? that part of my motion okay. that he would follow planning's, planning's recommendation. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? I'll, I'll vote in favor, but I wish the planning department actually had them pay the in lieu fund because I think it. It would be appropriate here, but since they didn't recommend that, it won't. I think it's really a very recently done sidewalk. It is. It's in very good repair. Yeah. Um, I, I visually inspected it again. Okay. I just feel so, that they yeah. recommend that for many properties in Nashville, and I'm not sure why they didn't do it okay. for this one. So you've lucked out. Okay. So we're about Thanks. to vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. You got your four votes. Congratulations. Thank you. No I really appreciate it. And nothing. thank you guys for your time. Okay. I, 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 Good luck. I really appreciate it. Okay. You guys do. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, as we regather our vice chairman and make a panel of five, we'll move to the next case, is which this is our 20, last real zoning case. This is our last today? zoning case for the night. Case 2018 uh, 689. It involves a property waited. at 314 Duke Street. The appellant is Inetta Presley also the owner of the property at this location, the quest is for a variance from minimum lot size requirements. In this, the R6A zoning district shown here and shown here on the aerial. In order to pursue a subdivision through the planning department for construction of two HPRs on each of the two subdivided lots, they would need this lot size variance from the BZA. Quick view of the street at this location, subject property from its face. This may be the most helpful thing. So, because there is an interest in subdividing these to this 100 foot wide lot, and you see all the other 50 foot lots along this stretch, uh, it still would not measure up to the minimum 6,000 square foot lot size per lot once subdivided, and thus there is the requirement to obtain this lot size variance in order to equip them to do that subdivision. Without the uh, variance, there is no subdivision. So the request before the board is just not about the number of units, not about the potential subdivision, just about the lot size variance. So uh, with a minimum of six, certainly that would be require 6,000 per the, in an unusual posture of a case, this is effectively a uh, preemptive request for a reduction in what would be uh, reduced 
So instead of saying it, there's 11,000 square feet, they need 12, we're really saying they would be 5,500 and 5,500 on two subdivided lots where they would need six. Forgive me for making that kind of a roundabout way of explaining it. Nevertheless, it is a lot size variance all the same. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 689? Seeing none, the appellant is present with her representative, also the district council member from District 5, Scott Davis. We'll uh, encourage you to introduce yourselves by name and address, and make the desired who, who, presentation. Who wants to go first? Okay, the applicant first. gets to go first. <laughs> uh, Mary Presley, <clears throat> I'm the realtor at 4397 Mount Sharon Road. Okay. Um, it, it's going to be kind of odd because the two. Oh, new please press the button. To the oh, there. The two new builds that is behind this lot, this builder is giving us 10 foot also that we already have wrote up and signed that it will be, then we will have enough for the lot but we will need this to be able to build on it. Wait, now what? Yeah. John, what is that? Did you hear that? Uh, previously and again tonight, yes. Um, the inclusion of other land from a neighboring property owner is something that the planning department will uh, make a determination upon with regard to exactly how many square feet are there. But At if, the end they of the day, permanent, if they had a permanent easement for 10 feet that put them over 12,000 square foot, wouldn't that it's still a matter of whether or not they get that subdivision approved. Uh, this may be considered a belt and suspenders approach, but the lot size variance is the best way for them to go forward. Because as I've noted before, a properly executed easement, which had been in play at one time, but had not been manifested as of the date we originally discussed it. I explained, uh, it's kind of like what some unfortunate lawyers might say is the law ain't the law until it's the law. Similarly, the negotiated easement that may have been drafted up, but not fully executed and recorded, is it valid yet? So the idea was proceed with your request for a lot size variance. Can I ask why are they giving you the the proper, why are they giving you their property? Because if you look at the lot beside it, the smaller lot where it goes back, there was a fence there that went straight across since 1945. And he owned that lot also, and he wanted to move his fence back. So for us to go ahead and remove the fence and the the building that was in the yard, he offered to give the other 10 feet so we wouldn't have to have the variance, is what happened. And we had it rolled up, but he did not file that. So now it's been an issue. So we have got it signed to get it filed again now and recorded. Now, when are you planning on building these? Um, I have these in contract with a builder to build the four on the lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I but we haven't closed. Like it'll be once we finish all this, it'll be another thirty to forty-five days. Then we close. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I tend to like to see, you know, like site plans and you know, just to say, you know, what I mean. I get conceptually what you're trying them. to do, but we got the concept. But plan. it just seems like that you you. I guess I'm not sure again why. I mean, it sounds like we're here just to save a little bit of time, but not really necessary. So I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you have the drawings here that we can look at? So, Mr. Taylor, you've seen these plans. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's a fairly generic concept plan that's got a lot of concrete on it. But, I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like it It feels like it's a little bit cart before the horse. But, um, and yet, it, you know, I, I get it. it I know it, it, it makes, you know, I know what they're trying to do. But it, it just seems like one of those things, if you could get a 10-foot easement, you could solve it yourself. And why are we here? But I, I mean, I'd rather, I mean, other than it's, it's an easy answer to say, well, no, we're close, but you know, I mean, is there, is there a hardship besides we're close, but no cigar? Uh, you gotta forgive me. Um, all right. This case makes me very angry, not with them, 
okay? Um, this is actually her aunt, who's been a long-term constituent of mine. And this is, and this is my feelings. Um, please do not punish the applicant for my feelings, please, okay? But what has happened here, I feel like a developer took advantage of them. And what they did was they were like, hey, we live in the South, everybody wants to be neighborly and friendly because we're raised properly. And what happened, you know, was that when, when, they, when, they were, when they agreed to give them the 10 feet, which would have kept them in compliance, you know, they were supposed to give them the, the 10 feet in the rear, you know, and the paperwork was drawn up, but the developer, be it intentionally or not, didn't file it. And so, of course, you know, we come down to our, our great codes office who does everything to help people, you know, more than anybody knows. And I did, we're trying to figure out the best way. The hardship here is that they were hoodwinked. And the problem is now I went and I spoke to the developer, mean Councilman Davis. You know, I'm nice to you wonderful people, but when someone takes advantage of my constituents, I get very upset. And so I'm like, dude, you need to fix this. So sign the paperwork and we started giving everything rolling. You know, initially I did not know he was going to sign it or not. Sometimes they tell me to go fly a kite and some, or sometimes their conscience gets the best of them. But he did sign right. it, right? I, he did sign the agreement, right? I mean, I thought that he, everything was signed, but he did not um, file it. File but, that. but you met with him and to, to get it. But did he sign? It, is it filed now, or what's the? No, state? he said it will be filed once we do this. <clears throat> that no way if if he even gave it to us, he said that we, there's no way that we would be able to build on the property unless we came to y'all. And that's when I went to the councilman because that didn't make any sense to me because he has sold the back two property now. And even in the paperwork where he sold it, he had gave us the property, but now the property owners won't sign it until we come here to get it rezoned and then they'll give the 10 feet. And instead of me... We're not, we don't rezone anything. Not rezoning, but... but... I guess if we, if we do what... If we do what you request, and you don't have, they don't have to have the 10 feet. So, I mean, I guess that's why I'm confused. Yeah, that's why they're telling us you to come they're here, to because come here. they want us to do something. So we say, oh, you don't need the 10 feet now, right? No, regardless, we've already talked to an attorney. He's given yeah. us the 10 feet regardless. She's already talked to the attorney. Okay. Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, but well, that's, that's where I am. But we I mean, have it in contract to sell. We were supposed to have enclosed on this property. So he's held up the whole process of her moving. She lost the house she was wanting because it wasn't fouled. It's been a tremendous just mess. What I'm really not happy about it is it was government property that he got on the back end, and he filed the paperwork to turn around, and he got the property at no cost to him with selling the property to pay half of it back to the state. But I, I guess, you know, it still goes back to the original question. If if, mm -hmm. if and when, I mean, if you think you're going to, I guess I'm just confused on the 10 feet. And, and the bottom line, though, is you're asking for almost an 8, 9 foot, or 9 percent uh, variance without a, a strangely shaped lot in a, in a, which is close, but it's, but you also Well, have, if we add the lot next door we could still do multiple builds on it. Like if we combine those two lots. Which lot next door are you talking about? The, one the smaller the one there. Okay. But that's not how we were selling the property. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, and I'm just, I'm just talking it through, but one of the things I always look for is, is there a solution that the owner can control that doesn't require us to make a decision? And it, I mean, and that's, it keeps sounding like there is. And that's why I'm saying, well, if you can fix it, if there's a way for you to fix it, although I think our solution might be the most convenient for you, and I, and I get that too. Uh, I'm just trying to, to sort it all out. Other questions of the applicant? I'm not sure how to, or what to ask, but so there, this builder owns something on Prince Avenue here? The two properties that are directly behind it. Mm -hmm. Here? Mm -hmm. Yes. He owns... Those. Yes. And he agreed to give you 10 feet along here, mm -hmm. along the rear property line, yes. because of something that's So that we could fence. move the fence up on that slide? On the so, small Because one. they were, if you looked at the lot without looking at the tax records, 
both of them would go to the same. The fence goes all the way across. It don't go way up to that other house. And it's been that way. So we could have fought him in court on that so that he couldn't have moved that fence. So to make that easier for him, we went ahead and moved it and we let him move the fence and he did the paperwork. We signed the paperwork and then we put the, the property up for sale. We have a buyer on the property, so when they went and pulled the deed, that's when they seen that it was not on there. Okay, so we're members. Any other questions before we deliberate? Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Before we, before before you before the board delivers mm -hmm. and I am apologize I'm not a lawyer or anything but the key here is you have the, the neighbors the new neighbors who are wonderful people behind them who were kind of like well we don't want to necessarily give up 10 feet even though we did sign in the paperwork of the closing and you know and then I didn't want to put my neighbors against my neighbor you know, you know as against them and then looking at what happened with when the developer needed the fence, you know, my suggestion was, dude, you need to sign this to fix it. But then I don't know if, unless with a, even if he does that, which I, which he's done now, is it going to solve the problem? You know, I mean, or hopefully it does. But I don't know if you guys can make a a motion that this is approved, pending that everything is is signed and filed with the with the proper, either the, I don't know if it's the registered okay. deeds or the, um, but I guess, the, the, I guess the thing is that I don't think if, if they get that, I don't think they need us. That's the whole point, right? That's why I think they, their intention was to get us to approve it and then they'll say, oh, you don't need the 10 feet, just go do what you need. Yeah. I don't think they yeah. have any intention. It wasn't explained to me that way at Coke. <coughs> like the way you're saying it, that's how I figured. Mm -hmm. If you sign it over, then it's ours, we can do it. But when I went to Coast, they're saying no. But if they're slow, I'm talking about the 10 feet. If they're slow giving. about signing and filing and then tell you, oh, come to us first, they want to keep their 10 feet and they're just hoping that you get what you want from us so you could build and then they'll say, oh, you don't need the 10 feet, we'll just keep it. Can they get an approval for a couple of months until <laughs> this gets worked out? Well, or just, to, I mean, you defer it a month and just say, come back in January if you hadn't worked it all out. If they're closing in 45 days, that still gives them time to get this before that, if that's the case. I mean, I don't, that's just. That's the best I'm willing to do. Sure. Because I feel like I don't want to, you know, we really are just, uh, I, what our job is to do is make sure that due process occurred. And I don't want to get in the business of somebody thinking, well, we'll go this route in case we need it, and then we're going to have people coming in and we'll be doing the same thing. Well, well, we think we're going to be able to work it out, but if we can't, just in case, can you give us this relief? And I don't think that's really how we ought to be considering our cases, but I'm not opposed to deferring it to see if it gets resolved. Well, and I, I know we've gotten a proposed site plan too, but I, I also think on some things like these, if you're, if you're, made, if you're asking for a variance, that, I mean, you really need to more develop. I mean, I think the neighbors deserve okay. it and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, you're saying site plan, you're saying well, I mean, this I, I, week, I, so. Well, I mean, I, I, my, my first thing is exactly, you know, what was said, and that is that, you know, have you have you truly exhausted all your options to solve this before coming to us? And, and that, I think they're being proactive, but it, what they've said is, no, there's all this stuff that's still out there. And they're getting, they're getting mixed signals. I don't think that, they, you know, I mean, and I get it. They're confused. If they're confused, then obviously we would be confused. Okay, um, so board members, what's your recommendation? Well, that, that's why I thought, you know, I mean, you know, do you defer it a month and then and let them try to figure it all out and get things filed and <clears throat> and hopefully not even have to come back? Okay. Someone make a motion. No, I'm, I'll move that we defer the case um, to the first meeting of January to give them a chance to work out the details um, before having to come back. Okay, motion's been made, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, aye. opposed, passes. See you.
Okay, short, short break, John Michael. Uh, no, I'm, leaving. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. What I'll move is that the zoning administrator did not err, that they did uh, rent without uh, a permit, and that based on the specifics of the case, that they would be allowed to apply for a permit uh, three months after the last uh, known rental, which was September 17th. So they'd be eligible to apply on December the 17th. We can do anything from a year down. Um, and so if we, and the way, um, well, what, and what they, what we, uh, there are people, you know, it's very common that we have folks that say, I just didn't have a clue. And for those folks, and, and if they immediately, when they find out, they cancel, they, they send people away, uh, they immediately say, hey, I, I screwed up. Um, it's not uncommon for us to say, you know, that's a, that's three. If they didn't cancel, then it's somewhere between, you know, three and nine. If they really are bad actors, then they get you know the full year. But in the cases like this, where you only have a, a, a six a six rental history, and uh, or a six rental known history, now they may have others that didn't uh, put in a you know a, a, a review. But when uh, I mean that's that's something that we've evolved at. But again, we can talk about what, what that should be, but it, um, typically, a, you know, it's a, it's a, a good actor is one that when they're notified to say, Hey, you needed a permit and they're like, Oh God, I didn't know. What do I do? Well, do it. Here's, here's the process and they do everything right. Then, then that's a, a situation where we've generally said, Hey, after about three months then you can go ahead and apply and, and get right with the system and, and keep doing uh, what you're doing. But I mean, it's, again, it's a, there's, <coughs> Four of us, and you have to have four votes, and so. Yeah. For, well, right, right. So if we just said no, that they, and and I don't know if it. I think that the, the specific language is up to 12 months, not uh, that we have a we have the right to to. Now some people it, again, you're you're going to have different um, different people have different uh, council people have different interpretations. Some say up to 12, and some say no, it starts at 12 and you go down. Well. However, each of us get to the answer that's right. That's that's the the process. I mean, you can say, well, no. You, I mean, I, I think all of us have said in our own way. Well, you know, they, they originally said it was a year, and then it could be less. And and what are those what are those criteria for uh, for being in different categories? And and again, it, we have a new board because we have a new board member. Uh, but in the past, we've said, well, you kind of divided into four. Quadrants, you know, three, six, nine, twelve. It makes it easier, you know, than saying, you know, what's a one, what's a two, what's a, you know, what's a twelve, uh, a twelve-point uh, penalty box. You know, it's really no. We'll look at it maybe on a four-point, and then what are the, <coughs> what are the different areas? I mean, and there's some that are actually zero because, you know, their site went live. They never rented, but the site went live to get the insurance, and they didn't do anything. I mean, they haven't done. Anything. They never rented, and for some. Folks like that, we say, well, no, you're you're fine immediately because you really didn't do anything wrong. But we don't provide any relief to applicants. Then they have to wait a year, okay. right? I'm pretty sure I'm remembering <coughs> correctly that the ordinance was changed to say up to 12 months. Right. And so yeah. up to 12 months once it goes to the BZA, it's one month if nobody appeals to the BZA. BZA can go up to 12 months. Yeah, sorry, one year without coming to the BZA, up to 12 while they're here. And that was something that was changed from the original ordinance, correct? I think that's correct. Yeah, that's my recollection. So I, I, that, that was, my motion was to, uh, to acknowledge that the zoning administrator did not err, and based on this specific case, um, provide a penalty of three months past, uh, from the last known rental, which is uh, when the, the offending behavior uh, ended, which 
was September 17th, according to the testimony. Um, the, the, the rental record, according to Mr. Osborne, was in July and August, but the, the applicant said they took down the site in, in, on the 17th, and that's why I said the 17th is the start date, uh, which would put them eligible to apply for a permit on the 17th of December. And did I get it? Was there a second or no? I, I can second. Okay. And is, um, is there a discussion? Any discussion? Okay. okay. Um, then all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes. So you're eligible to apply on December 17th. You don't have a permit. You have to apply for a permit. Don't rent, advertise anything yes, until you get that permit. Awesome. All Thank right, you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, the next dock of the case is 2018-598. Joy Goodwin is the appellant. This is a short-term rental case. Prior operation before obtaining the legally required permit at the 510 McDonald Drive address. If the appellant will come forward, you'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Please begin by introducing yourself by name and address after Mr. Osborne makes the presentation on behalf of staff. We found out about this one through host compliance. We sent a notice on June 1st, uh, 2018. Um, they were operating from December 2017 to May of 2018, uh, about 28 rentals. Uh, the advertisement was removed around June 12th. Um, some of the information in the email uh, caused me to have a little bit of concern. Claimed to find out from friends, claimed to research the ordinance and been confused. Uh, and then the advertisement was removed about the same time that she would have received the letter. So, I mean, would, I'm sorry, did you say there was rental history after? Not after June. So June was the last rental history that you know of? Right, because that's when the advertisement was removed. And so when was the first time that we contacted them? It was that notice in June. June 1, okay. Yes, sir. And so, I'm sorry, what was the confusion? You just thought that, that you thought there was a signal that they said they may have known they were supposed to have a permit, or? She said she looked online and was confused and took information from friends. Okay. And also mentioned coming in to apply for a permit and getting denied for a year. Um, yeah, that's not the case. Okay. Any other questions for, for Mr. Osborne? All right, could you tell us why you're here and Tell me what happened. Um, Joy Goodwin, I'm at 510 McDonald Drive. Um, I mean, what he said was accurate. Um, I did do some research before I started my Airbnb. I read <coughs> online um, and I did speak to several friends that I have that own and operate short-term rentals, um, most of whom operate in their home, which mine is as well. Um, I live upstairs. The unit is in the basement. Um, I was led to believe, unfortunately, that I didn't need a permit since it was in my home. <clears throat> so I began operating, um, loved it, was very successful. I had a really fun time. Um, got the letter in June, took the listing down, took my social media down, um, did uh, go meet with the gentleman at the code's office to find out about getting the permit. Um, and he said, he did tell me at that point that I'd have to wait um, a year to get a permit. Um, started that uh, the process of getting it, um, starting the appeal, um, and I'm here just to ask for. So, the, when was the last day you rented the, the property? So, I did honor some reservations that I had past that June date. Um, there was one, the last one was in early um, September. Um, I Something else that I wasn't aware of or was confused about, um, the Airbnb sent out a notification that they were submitting taxes on our behalf. So all of that stuff was so confusing to me, but I have since um, gone and paid all of my retro taxes for all of the um, all of the stays that I had for the whole time for this year. I have proof of that um, uh, with the late fees and all of that. Um, I got the business license that I needed. Uh, I did everything that I missed the first time to my own um, error, but I want to I want to operate it again. I loved it. It was so fun. We had people from all over the world come and stay. Um, never had complaints from my neighbors. Um, and I, just, I want to do it right. I did not um, try to cheat the system by not getting a permit. I just really felt like I was told I didn't need one or misread it or it was my own error. Um, but I want to do it right, obviously, moving forward. So that's why I'm here. Any questions for the applicant? Why did, why did you honor the rentals after you got the letter? 
I'm a single mother, and I was very much relying on that income. That's my answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Then we'll close the public hearing discussion. Well, it's a little bit more severe than the last one because they, she did honor that. Was it when was it in September? Um, I have to look at the exact date. It was somewhere mid, early to mid September. Okay, so I'm. I was thinking. Well, the application date is September 25th. So I'm thinking more like a four-month penalty from September 25th. If I can make that into a motion, if anyone. Um, so I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err and that the um, applicant be able to reapply for the permit four months from the application date to the BZA, which was September 25th, 2018. We have a motion. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. You're able to apply for a permit on January 25th. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice Chairman, we will lose one more member at this hour, and that will ruin our quorum. With that reduction from four to three, the board is no longer legally eligible to conduct any further business. For those whose cases are still docketed but have not yet been heard, specifically the short-term rental cases, these are cases 606, 618, 658, 661, 662, 669, 670, 671 through 673, and then 675. Those are the cases that were not previously deferred or withdrawn. We are going to call a specially called meeting of the Board of Zoning Appeals on Thursday, uh, December the 13th, 1 p.m., this room, this location, same time as usual. The only cases on that deck, docket, at least at present, will be the short-term rental cases that were not deferred or withdrawn from today's docket. Although it will not be a terribly long meeting, we want to clear that docket. We've confirmed that we will have a quorum uh, meeting and eligible to conduct that business. It will be property no properly noticed through the Metro website. Uh, information will be sent to the council office as well so that those folks will be apprised. To the extent you have any questions, come see our staff, email our office, will be of help as best we can. With that, we conclude today's BZA meeting and we announce once again the specially called meeting for that limited docket on Thursday, December the 13th. Our next regularly scheduled BZA meeting will be Thursday, December the 20th. Have a safe night. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.com.